She was like, can you? She's like, I can do it. I can try, but I'm afraid I'm going to. My boyfriend works. wasn't around. I know how this video ends. Can you carry my <laughs> dog into my, my apartment for me real quick? No, 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 no. It wasn't like that. But it was. Then I need some. She, I, my hips you are starting to clean her pool. You're going to clean she, out the oil. Yeah, you got to put the I almost. I hesitated to bring that part up because I knew it would go this way. But it's <laughs> I didn't not order that. sausage. It's not that. She. <laughs> Play brought to you by Barstool Sports, presented as always by our very good friends at Chevrolet. Uh, we got a lot to get to. We got Padraig Harrington on this show, who's awesome, who talks about everything from Tiger Woods stories to tips and lessons and all kinds of great stuff. Uh, we got Tiger Woods PNC. We got the World Cup final. I'd like to be the first to um, say to Dan Rappaport and to Jake Bass, Happy Hanukkah. Thank you. I appreciate oh, very that. Nice. Thank Happy you. Happy Hanukkah. Hanukkah. Yeah, and yesterday was Hanukkah and my birthday. Yeah, it was a big day. Wow. Oh, happy birthday wow. as well. Oh yeah, man, I win. fucked up. I didn't I didn't I didn't know. I would have texted Saw you this I didn't morning. Know. So Instagram stories this morning or something on social media with that this morning. And you know, I just thought I'd say it on the show today. Bigger platform than just a text message. I compl- I I take that to heart. Thank you. Happy well, belated. Thanks. Well, I think I mean Hanukkah is probably more spiritual and important than a birthday. And I was the first one to say happy Hanukkah. So happy Hanukkah to you, Dan. Um, hope you're having a great season. We got eight days, right? What are we on day two? This is day two. Yeah, we're we're just getting we're just getting fired up. It leads right into Christmas too. So it's really just a festive time. Fantastic, beautiful, beautiful time of the year. Uh, it's going to be December twentieth when this puppy comes out. I know we say it all the time, time flies, but it sure does. Uh, we're going to do a little program update. We got. Um, Two shows this week. We got a great interview with Carson Daly coming out on Thursday. And then we got one show next week. Um, We're technically off. The office is closed. But we did record an interview with Aaron Wise that we're going to put out. And we'll throw out a little show for next week as well in between Christmas and New Year's. But that's kind of our time off. Video-wise, we do not have any time off. We've got Barstool Classic Championship coming out, I believe, tonight, Tuesday, when folks are listening to this. And then we have the debut Thursday of a little series that's been teased for months now called... Fixing Frankie, is that right? Yeah, it's insane. That's coming out Thursday. Brendan's been working hard on it. I've been trying to avoid looking at it because I I was gonna like have more hands on it. And I said, dude, I can't edit a video of myself like this, like something where I'm sitting in a therapy session. Like I would I would cut it all out. Like there's a lot of embarrassing parts about him exposing like who I am as a person. And I'm just I I had to step away from it. So I'm really excited. I'm going into the into the city today to see a, a first cut of it. Um it's crazy when you think about just like 11 months ago, I think it was, we did a video with Tommy Fleetwood and I legitimately couldn't, I could not get the ball onto the green when we were chipping. Like he was like, all right, we're going to do this video and you're going to chip this ball onto the green so we can see if we can help you out. And I couldn't get it on 25 attempts. The video went on for 20 like minutes, 30 yards, 20 yards, 20 yard chip. Like chip, he's like, just do it. I'm like, Bro, I can't. I'm telling you, I'm looking down at this ball and I don't know how to get it up in the air. And then now, Fast forward, if I do that, one of my buddies was like, dude, I've been watching all your videos. You've been posting so many recently, and I've been loving it. You just go on YouTube, hit next, next, next. And I saw you blade one, and that was in Myrtle Beach at the end of that one round. Yep. And he's like, Frankie doesn't do that. Like, that's not that's not something he does anymore. Like, that, it was shocking to see. How have we gone that How have we gone that much of a difference in only a year? And it's because you know of how. this fucking video. Yeah. I think it's fun for the viewers because they've seen you play recently and you're obviously so much improved. And now they can see the process of how you actually got there. I was nervous about that at first because I kind of wanted it to be like Trent series where like each week you'd watch me go out and try and get better. But because of scheduling and because of production, we didn't get a chance to do that. So now it's like, hey, I already did this. Look at how it happened. So that's kind of like the difference in the series that I didn't originally have it planned out to be that way. But I think it works that like my best series on camera ever happened the week right leading up to it. So well, I'll say too. I mean, it was pretty well documented how dark of a place that you were in with your kids. <laughs> yeah, I think true. people will be taken <laughs> back there very quickly. <laughs> uh, I'm excited to watch it because it has been a dramatic shift for you, and we all laugh about your mental head games and you're going down. You know, you're the guy sprinting down the hill a million miles an hour and tripping over yourself, and now you translate that to golf, and you have gotten amazingly better at golf this year to the point where different travel series that we do every single episode of uh, break at 90 it's like you legitimately went from a 10 or 11 handicap down to a legitimate like five handicap in a couple months it's fucking, i was gonna ask what was your crazy. index what's the index difference so from i the was beginning? like a 10 8 and 11 starting when i was down in um georgia with dr brett mccabe and then now most recently i was like a four nine five one to end the season i think i'm a five one so 
Yeah, crazy. That's amazing. And that's a hard, like going oh, yeah. from a 25 to a 15 or something, I think you can shave a decent number relatively quickly. Going from a 10 to a 5 is difference between shooting 88 and shooting 78. And that's an enormous difference out there when you add it up at the handicap system. Like as you start to narrow in closer to zero, I feel like it becomes really, really difficult to shave a shot or two shots. Yeah, it all started with the breaking 90, honestly. I don't know what happened, but we went out and like shot four of them in a row, and I could not, I, I couldn't go on the other side of 80, no matter what and I now, did. Now comes the extra hard part, which is going from 10 to 5 is super hard. Going oh, from 5 yeah. to 0 is even harder. So that, it's just. Yeah. Well, what's good about it is we only have like two or three of these things filmed. So the more that I keep going with like episodes, it's going to help me get even lower. So I still have to do a putting thing, and hopefully we're going to go and get it done with Trevor Emelman, which will be a lot of fun. But like, that's going to be the fun part of the second half of the series is like, how do we get even better now? Which is insane to even think about. I don't, I think there are some things I can really, really improve on. You got to see my putting, but um, yeah, it's exciting. Thursday night. I can't believe that's coming out. I feel like it's not going to come out, but we'll see. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And then tonight, again, the Barstool Classic Championship, you heard us rave on the show about how blown away we were that this thing has actually turned into the reality that it's turned into the championship, the whole setup, the staging of it, the signage, how like pro event it felt was just stunning and amazing. And our team did such a phenomenal job. And then the inside job where our very good friend, Josh Isner, who takes us all to Pebble Beach every year, um, him and his partner Mahoney won the tournament. Uh, so you get all those kind of uh, uh, theatrics and the, and the drama down the stretch and then just kind of the dry heave and us hitting closest to the pin over the water at night. The entire experience of the Barstool Classic Championship, these guys wrap up uh, into a video that's going to kind of show you the entire presentation and take you through the whole thing tonight. So that'll be on our YouTube page as well. So videos, interviews, shit's just coming out, even though it's Hanukkah and Christmas season. Yes, Dan. I got one, your one more. I appreciate that. Yes, one more administrative note. I've got a winner for for the Black Friday Cyber Monday contest. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, just gonna go ahead and say the guy's name, David Hamill from Duxbury, Massachusetts. You have won the contest. Wow. You and a friend of yours of your choosing come up here to New York when it gets warm. Uh, I recommend waiting until like September. That's when the, the golf course is kind of perfect. But obviously, we'll make it work with schedules. We're going to play golf. We're going to we're going to give the full Quaker experience. We're going to drink. We're going to have caddies. It's going to be a hell of a day. Uh, you and a buddy. So congratulations on winning the contest. Congratulations. Congrats. That's hell of a hell of a David Hamill playing at that David Hamill. golf club. David Very Hamill. exclusive. Yeah. Golf Frankie's club. never been there. I don't think. No, but. no, really not, not out there. It's like. Like, never like an official blessing. appearance. No, yeah. yeah, never an official appearing. appearing we essentially blessing. snuck on and yeah. like I did something don't illegal. Believe that you guys were there. So it's what I used to do at the Eisenhower Blue Course. I used right. to hop the fence behind the baseball field with my dad, and we would take all the golf club, the balls from. He has got on here. to my golf course. That's like <laughs> yeah. Boss, my no fuck no no no. You, maybe it was like Quaker Hill. I think there's one. That I love. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's very exciting. Um, before that we is. get into anything, I wanted to start the show with some. This isn't breaking news, but it is breaking news in the sense that we haven't talked about it. From Bolt to Blazer, Equinox to Silverado, Chevy EVs are for everyone everywhere. You're gonna hear on this show we talk about energy, we talk about the future. EVs are the future. Uh, we're running out of gas. When are we running out of gas, fellas? I think it's 47 years from today. 47 years from today, out of gas, planet Earth, out, gone. Fossil fuel, the whole deal, gone. So EVs are going to be the future. They already are the future. They're here. EVs are for everyone everywhere as well. You might think that you need to be some super rich person to get one. Maybe it used to be that way. Not anymore. A few of Chevrolet's beloved and best-selling uh, have now been designed as electric vehicle models powered by Ultium. They got electric vehicles available now. You can buy the Bolt EV and the Bolt EUV. You can reserve now the Blazer EV and the Silverado EV. Chevy does it phenomenally. I saw a Blazer in in real life uh, this weekend, and I was wow. you know, walking across the street, and it was a red one. And it took my breath away. Mm. It really did. It took me a second mm-hmm. to be like, what car is that? It was coming up. And I said, stop right in front of me. I was in like a little village where the Wanna restaurant was across the street. Everywhere. And I kind of like side eyed this fucking thing. Like it was like a like a chick walking down the street or something. I'm looking at it like, what is that? Red like, dress. Looking, needed help. Red dress. Dog I'm looking at her like I'm looking mm-hmm. at this car. And I was like, and then the Chevy hit me. I was like, wow. 
I actually waited for it to drive by, and I, I looked to see what what which one it was, and it was the Blazer. Uh, with an established full line brand like Chevrolet, we can offer multiple EV vehicles with the volume, the variety, and the value customers all over the world have come to expect. Chevy EVs for everyone, everywhere. If you, did you guys see what happened in the nuclear fusion world uh, oh, on December 13th? You haven't. See, that's no. stunning to me because this is like <laughs> this was a monster day for humanity and no one knows about it. So I'm going I'm, I'm this came across my desk on December 13th. <laughs> Wendell Pierce tweeted this out, and it got a hundred delay to be talking about it. If it was so well, you know, I actually six, I, I, I I had it on my list, and we just got into too many interviews recently, and I okay. just didn't have a chance. I didn't have the platform. Is that now, the is that the Wendell Pierce from The Wire actor? Yeah. Okay. Great yeah. actor. Yeah, okay. Wendell Pierce. Bunk Moreland, he's there he is. Ah, nuclear fission guy too. He's pretty so basically in there. he's he's he was beat. just he was just the the person tell, talking about. It, but there's videos. So basically, they had this press conference. They, I guess, scientists, big fusion had this press big conference science saying that. So this big was the tweet. Fusion. This is this is what came across my desk. Remember this day, nuclear fusion breakthrough. We have harnessed the power to create nuclear fusion with lasers eliminating the need for fossil fuels and without any radioactive waste. This break this breakthrough creates unlimited clean renewable energy. Now the battle begins. The oil companies will fight to keep the billion dollar profit. Blah 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 blah. They went on and on and on. Essentially, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory has harnessed the power of the sun. This is one of the greatest scientific scientific discoveries of our age. Hopefully, the media will give it the attention it deserves. So I did more digging into this. Essentially, it's the first time they've ever gotten more energy out of this test. Than they had put in so they put in the amount of energy they're able to like recreate the amount of energy that the sun and stars give off and they've never gotten it back so let's say it was like 2.3 whatever the metric is that they put in they got 2.8 back and it was like a everyone kind of sat what? back 2.3 i have just no fucking ener- idea. energies just whatever the number is controls. i don't know i have no idea but essentially okay. it came back so now they're saying holy fuck like we can build off of this um, I wish I had like what it was. Every t- every single fucking article you click on, they want you to subscribe. It's insane. You can't just click on an article anymore and read it. Don't it's get like, lost in the details, though. Yeah, what you- she, you got to think like, what, like a star destroyer in Star Wars. This is like you got to have this kind of power to be flying one of those puppies around. That's that's kind of what I'm thinking. You can't just be can't be putting fucking gas into that thing and hoping you're going to get across the, no. the universe. Right. That's what I was going to say. Is it essentially like you, they had they put five gallons of gas in this thing mm-hmm. and then it came back with eight gallons of gas in it. Correct. Okay. Yeah, I saw Correct. Avatar last night. There are wow. some ships there that could probably use use some of this. Interesting. Situation. How was Avatar? It was good. I fell asleep for like a, a solid hour. Um, what? It was, it was three that, hours. It was, was three common hours. For you? It's three hours and 20 minutes. And it was my birthday. So, you know, it was a little banged up. And I said to myself, like, listen, I'm, I'm just going to I'm going to fall asleep during this movie because I can't stay awake for three hours and 20 minutes. And I fell asleep, woke up for the end. And it was great. You're there for the visual. The visuals were great. But yes, Frankie, it feels like we're closer to a, a, a place where visiting a place like Pandora could be possible after this. I fall asleep during a, a movie before it's first like a, a, a in the theater. I mean, I've done that before, for sure. Yeah, I definitely I definitely I've fall done that before. I actually did somebody, did somebody did say that. mega jewels before? Nope. No. Oh, that's what it was. I thought someone like was making fun of it and said, "Is it Mega Jewels?" Did no one somebody say that? Said a gajillion or something, or I said like cajoles or cajoles. All right, well, yeah. it's called Mega Jewels. J O U L E S. Is that what you MJs? So we put two point oh five MJs in and got three point one five MJs out. They're calling it Mega the most Jules? impressive scientific, the most imp- impressive scientific feat in the twenty first century. I think when it comes to it's falling BBC. asleep in com. movies, I'm I'm pitching a perfect game. I've never fallen asleep in a movie. I've this fallen movie asleep was once. three hours and twenty minutes. Right, that's that's certainly the biggest hill you've ever had to climb in terms yes. of a movie. But but I, I've never sat. Titanic was pretty long, right? It was Titanic two oh, and a half. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's James Cameron. Cameron. He loves it. He loves it. He takes um, his time. But you know the boobies they keep you awake. But uh, outside of I, I've never. I don't think I've ever come close to falling asleep in a movie. Maybe I don't know though. Certainly not for an hour. Yeah, no, I was out for a while, but it was cool. Was putting on the time. 3D glasses like that's not really a thing anymore. So that was kind of fun. You, you didn't lose like track of the like storyline. You didn't. You were just you woke up and were were you being like um, 
Were you well, annoyingly I, inquisitive when you woke up of like, yo, yo, so like what's what I miss here? That would be- well, I don't know if you guys saw the first Avatar, but, you know, it's it's not exactly The Departed, you know, with there's not a lot going on, right? It's just yeah, yeah. good versus like evil. like Pocahontas, right? Exactly. So I woke up and I turned to Emma. I was like, did I miss anything? She's like, no. So How is that possible? It's just good versus evil. It's really just there's right. the good guys and the bad guys and they're fighting each other. Ken Jack said not- it was like the most impressive thing he's ever seen in in film like the actual viewing experience yeah, it was, was definitely different did you watch it, it in was, imax 3d yeah we watched it in imax 3d the one in union square it was crisp as hell it was yeah it was it delivered on what i wanted it to deliver on which was like ho- multiple times during the movie i was like holy shit that is delivered really- a nap which is not the greatest <laughs> right, right. I, that's the first review of that movie that i've seen where the person fell asleep <laughs> Telling you the truth, guys. <laughs> the first one. Oh, you guys aren't um, too hyped up about the Holy Grail. Well, fusion, all right. Let, I want to ask this though: what what is it? What does it mean? Stop. And two, what's the timetable on it actually being put into use? Well, the energy that came out of it is only enough to boil fifteen kettles of water right now. Like they, it's like they essentially there's they Sam haven't it. figured out how to like mass produce what? it. You have to now, now that they've proven that it works regardless of how much energy was used to put in to get out. It's the first time it's ever worked ever in the history of mankind that we've put this much heat in nuclear fusion towards something and then gotten more heat and whatever, more uh, not heat but more power back. So yeah, now the back. question is now the question is how do you But see Riggs, you're like talking down on this thing. Why you don't like you don't think this is cool? My I'll say my it's like it's uh, step uh, one. Uh, it's literally step it's one t- of like maybe in a hundred years it can be like, holy shit, remember that experiment? Like when it's we were tough just like when the phone came out, it was the, literally it's, it's tough for me to contextualize how important it is. I don't like it's uh, they got it's seven power. kettles of water is what they got. I mean, that's not <laughs> I mean, that's they, they got power. Bit. They got power. They literally created power. They literally created power. They what, didn't my... need oil, they didn't need fucking natural gas and all that shit. They literally just created power, more power than they put into it. It's the first time ever in the history of mankind. My gut says that this is something my grandkids' as grandkids are going to enjoy. Yeah, I'm sure when they mass produce the ability to be able to shoot out all this power to cities and homes and all that stuff, sure. But this is where it started. Just like when Alexander Graham Bell, whoever the fuck made the phone, like you literally called the person in the room next to him. Like that was holy shit. This guy's talking through a wire to the guy over here in the next room. How's that happening? And like now I'm on my cell phone looking at fucking fat titties. But like at the end of the day, like. You needed that to happen. So, like, that's he, he was getting fucking dragged through the street that people were put where they were putting flowers around his neck. We got to be doing I, this for these people. I do feel like we're closer now to winning the energy race where, you know, we're going to have a source that we that is abundant and available faster than we run out of energy. So, I, I and it's happened I in America, feel, by the way. So, yeah, this yeah, is, is big, this is like the that. race. That's great. It is interesting. Majules. There was. <laughs> Mega jewels. They're gonna. We're gonna put a bunch of mega jewels in our car, and we're gonna. It's gonna be clean. Probably mega be... hole lays or some stupid shit. Um, I'm probably saying it wrong. It is funny. Growing up, I remember like a real concern of mine as a child was that we were gonna run out of gas. That we were gonna run out of fossil fuels. Well, we are. We, no, I know we are. We have Forty-seven it, years left. I looked it up last last night. Right. Forty-seven so, years left of gas. <laughs> That's insane. Yeah, it's, it's, you'd hope it'd be more. There's but literally, fu- there's literally just a there's literally a cap. It's just like this is all we have left. Because you can't wait the hundreds of millions of years for all these fossils to die and create that more. That get me to 75. I think I would be fine with that. I but mean, that's, that's a problem. But <laughs> you know if what you I mean? find a source like you're talking about, Frankie, which is, it sounds like this is what it is, then that it doesn't matter. Then you just have clean energy for everything. But again, that seems like it's a couple hundred years away. Yeah, hundred it's years like it, it, this experiment's $3 billion, and it only like barely <laughs> produces enough. a couple of water. Yeah. <laughs> but that's how insanely hard it is. They have like a quarterly thing that they got to meet. Yeah, okay. probably. I'm sure. Oh, we just got a fucking budget put on us. Um, <laughs> no, that's. I mean, it's interesting. I, again, you said it came out December 13th. It's December 19th when we're recording this, and that's. It is crazy how news works. That I had no sort of idea what you were talking about. There is this crazy, like, scientific, like, part of Twitter that you really have to dig deep in, and then once you're there, these tweets have outrageous interaction numbers. Like that tweet had 160,000 likes and like no one came across it here. 160,000. Yeah, that is. I, that's part of like, I feel like what Elon's been trying to say, which is that he wants to get Twitter to a point where you don't just see stuff that you always see, where you can see stuff like that. Like that should have come across my desk. <laughs> Elon, Elon didn't like tweet about it, I don't think. So that fucking guy, because he's dealing with his own energy shit. 
Riggs, Battery. I have a question for you. True, he does. Yep. Riggs, I got a question for you. Mm-hmm. Who was your coach when you played for TI? Does Kaspa- Kapaslis or Breslin ring a bell? No. Okay. I just had to ask this because this four play tracker guy on Twitter has asked this question 27,000 times. Oh, he's a problem. And Alex Bush and I have been DMing it to his every time he asked for like he he just uh, he asked it again. So just want to get that on oh. record that it Kapaslis Ka- and Breslin were not your coach at TI. Nope. Cool. I don't remember right. my coach's name, to be honest with you. Moving on. 20 years ago. Yeah, four play tracker. Sure. He's a nice guy. He's on tw- I had to mute him for a little bit. He's been putting Frankie time out just because it's too much. And he, he's not affiliated with four play. And I feel like a lot of people think he might be. He tweets under every single tweet we put out. And it's just a lot of just like, I want to run the society. And it's just nonstop. The, it's like nonstop, nonstop <laughs> tweets and DMs. And I'm just like, I'm just going to choose to not see this for a little bit. But I'll, I'll take him out for sure. I'll take him out of mute the mute the mutosphere he's in timeout <laughs> a little bit he's in timeout um, it's just that when you uh, abuse your power it's uh, you got to be put into the corner a little bit you know what i mean i um, in the corner i i saved a, a dog's life this weekend i don't know if you guys you saw did that. yes <laughs> it was i'm i mean i'm a hero i don't want i don't i wasn't gonna publicize it but i i figured i'll, I'll bring it up we're talking about our weekends so what did happened? you offer or did the person ask what happened so the elevator in my building has been on the fritz for like a week. It's been going, it's been working, and then it has been working. I get a lot of emails and texts from the building people being like, we're really sorry that it's not working. And then we'll get an email like a day later, it's working. And then I'll go try to like check my mail and it won't be working. So it's on and off. So I think it was Friday. I was walking down. I'd ordered Uber Eats. And then I have to slug all the way down the stairs to go get it um, because I'm not going to make the guy take the stairs. That's just not what I want to do. So I was walking down there. When I got to the first floor, I saw my neighbor and she was on the phone and she's got this dog, Miley, who's a golden retriever. She was on the phone. I could tell that because when the elevator doesn't work, it's got like this thing. that just says like out of service on the bar where you usually see the number. So I could see that I wasn't working and she was on the phone and I was standing there kind of waiting for the food to get there. And she got off the phone and she was like, could you help me? carry my dog up to the third floor because the dog is old and has bad hips and she, usually her boyfriend is there but her boyfriend wasn't at home so he couldn't do it when the elevator breaks so i was like she was like can you she's like i can do it i can try but i'm I afraid i'm going boyfriend works. wasn't around yeah. Yeah. This video ends. can you carry my <laughs> dog into my, my apartment for me real quick no no no, no 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 it wasn't like that but it was and I need some. She, I, my hips are you starting to clean her pool. You're gonna clean out. Was, the oil yeah, you got things up. I almost. Before. I hesitated to bring that part up because I knew it would go this way. But it's I didn't not order that. sausage. It's not that. She. <laughs> she said. I. She was like. I could do it, but I'm afraid I'm gonna drop the dog. So then what? Am, and then it's on me. What am I gonna say? Like, no, I gotta get. I gotta wait for my Jersey Mike's. Good luck <laughs> hauling the dog up to the third floor. <laughs> and I was. I will say after she asked me, I was more than confident that I could do it. But I was because I was like, yeah, I can definitely do it. No problem. And then when I picked the dog up, I was like, we could be in a little bit of trouble here. But <laughs> I powered through. The dog's, dog. 70, dog's 75 pounds. Dog was Jesus. super chill, super nice. Didn't care that a complete stranger was picking her up. And I carried the dog up to the third floor, which is essentially like four flights of stairs. I was dying, dying. Yeah. But I put on a, I wanted to put on a brave <laughs> face for the dog. And Did you, you know, put the dog down like the second you got to the top step? Oh yeah. You, yeah. <laughs> I made sure to do it gently because of the hips, but I, yeah, I mean, I was, if and you if went across little, the chest, right? I, tw- I texted you and asked you what your, what was your strategy? You didn't go like a baby, right? Like over the shoulder. No, I, I just, I, I basically went under the dog's body and just yeah, lifted like him as a lifted box. Her up. Like as a, like yeah. she was just a, a package. Yeah. And the dog was like, all right, well, let's do it. Well, let's go up these stairs. And that was, you know, and you know, I tweeted this and it's, it's a little bit of sarcasm, but it's also true. Why do things like that if you don't get public praise for them? So totally. I, I wrote a whole tweet about it, and I was, I was honest about how I was looking for social points, and I got about 12,000 of them on Twitter. Yeah. And then yeah, at the end like, of the day, the person need to know about this. Was that like the person's son that tweeted at you? You actually got to see the dog on Twitter. Oh, it was, um, yeah, the, the guy who owns the dog's brother um, tweeted a picture. Amazing. At me being like, this is Miley. She's got bad hips. Thanks so the for boyfriend's caring. brother? Yes, the boyfriend's brother. Hmm. Um, you, 
Yeah. Did you have to go back down and then get your Jersey Mike still? I, I did. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so you did Sweat those players, You did those stairs twice. I did them a few oh, times. Yeah. Three times. Three times. Yeah. Thrice. Yeah. So wow. and then and then and then I somebody tweeted at me. It was very funny. I can't remember the exact wording, but then they were like the harrowing act of a man who will now go on his fifty hour of silence, fifty hours of silence, <laughs> which actually turned out to be true. I, I went back in my apartment, and this podcast was once again the first time that I've had human interaction this weekend. How old was the female, the the human? I don't know her exact age. Was it like an older, like a sixty year old woman, or was it a no? Okay. Like roughly same just age as like thirty, your like twenty five, thirty. I let's keep the focus on. I'm just asking. Quite, we need all the details because I don't need envi- those details. I envisioned this as like an old lady with gray yeah. hair. She had a she had a cane. I didn't know the boyfriend walker. wasn't home. Then when I heard the boyfriend wasn't home, and I'm thinking about like what's going on in this situation. That's the most like. Why don't you come in here? I'll give you a tip. No. scenario I've ever heard in my entire <laughs> life. Oh, she, that's legit a porn that you name no, we've, we've been dancing this is this is a you you your your brain has been twisted by pornography <laughs> <laughs> is what's going on here <laughs> i she said she was like i i am worried that if i try to do this that mm. i'm going to drop the dog those are the only details that you need and i was like all right for I'll, sure. I'll do this for sure yeah, all right um, I see. and i all went right. talked took the dog up went and got my jersey mics and didn't talk to anybody all weekend yeah. When she said thank you after that, would she like give you a, a like a Is hug, a hug, and embrace? No embrace. Nope. Oh, Nothing. I was nope. Like I just a, turned right. She, well, she definitely the... said thank you. She for sure said thank you. But I, I was like, yep. And I just turned around mm. and I got my food. What a moment! What a moment for Trent. Just never, it's heroic, never Trent. a dull moment on this podcast. With these, we're always getting into situations. That's a situation you found yourself in. It was. Uh, all right. Speaking of situation, PNC Championship. We had Tiger Woods and Charlie Woods this week. Um, a lot of wholesome content as we pretty much go through every year now. Tiger obviously elevated the status of this fucking thing three years ago. And now him and Charlie, you've got Annika out there. You got the dailies. You got all the father, son, the Thomases. It's just phenomenal to see every year. Uh, Tiger and Charlie, you can't make up that Charlie uh, rolled his ankle and was limping just identically to Tiger Woods. You just cannot, you couldn't fucking make that up. If you tried, I, I, I didn't know if it was like in si- the Seinfeld episode where his leg falls asleep and Charlie was like chirping Tiger at first because I didn't have audio. I think I was looking at a TV on like Friday when they were going through their uh, pro-am round or something. And I just saw Charlie limping off a tee box. And I was like, what is he doing? Is he like roasting his dad? And then find out he's rolled his ankle. So he's doing the identical limp to Tiger after he's hitting fucking fairways out there. It was insane. Uh, showed up with a part of my take head cover which was yeah. fucking unbelievable to see. Obviously, I saw people chirping off a little bit. Obviously, I would prefer that Tiger and Charlie Woods have <laughs> four play and barstool golf gear head to toe everywhere. But regardless of that, it's insanely cool that Charlie Woods showed up with a barstool, a pardon my take head cover. Um, those guys are massive. They're fucking hilarious. He's a fan of the show. I want to know that process. Like Charlie doesn't have any money. So it's like he had to use someone else's credit card or ask someone to get yeah. it for him that is probably are we allowed to look it up on like the on the store parents? is there like a tiger <laughs> woods like purchase in the back end of fucking I, <laughs> barstoolsports.com yeah i texted someone and they were like him and his friends all his friends are just obsessed with the show so i mean part like, of my take if- reaches everyone they reach 12 year olds and they reach like 60 year olds they're like the biggest podcast on the planet just Charlie yeah. just say to Robbie Mac, like, I'm, you know, I really want part of my take it cover that Robbie Mac takes care of. It. That like, to me how is that, how I think, how I think, think he, I bet you me, Erica handles that stuff. Would be my guess. Yeah, maybe. I was thinking he just sees it on his phone, like, oh, they're selling these head covers. And then he turns it, yeah, to Erica or Robbie or Tiger and is like, oh, I, I would love one of these. These things are cool. And then it appears, would be my guess. Also, who knows this? I don't, I'm not hip with all like the 12 to 14 year old like way of life anymore but now in this day and age with like apple pay and all of these like credit cards that you can just put yeah. in your phone like do kids just like do rich affluent children have like their parents just like apple pay just uh, hooked up to their phone maybe dan probably i probably <laughs> sorry that was a joke uh i can't <laughs> Why don't you tell us what I was going to say about the PNC <laughs> with that mustache? Tell us what's going on with the 12 and the 14 year old. Um, <laughs> you can't. You got to stay 100 feet away from him. 
<laughs> yeah, I don't know, actually. I can see from a distance. Um, it was <laughs> legitimately jarring going from watching the World Cup final, which congratulations, Riggs, on oh my God. winning. Amazing. Which was just maybe the greatest sporting event any of us had. I had watched with a bunch totally. of people who said it was the best sporting event they'd ever seen. So you're watching these guys putting their heart and soul out there, and the drama's out of control. And then I switched the golf channel, and literally everyone's limping. No one could fucking walk. <laughs> it wasn't just Tiger. It wasn't just Charlie. John Daly couldn't move. Yep. David Duvall was like tiptoeing around JT the place. JT was fucking limping. <laughs> I turn on the TV and everyone's like, why do you why, why do you like this sport? This is like the lamest thing I've heard. They could no one could walk. No there one weren't could walk. enough tweets about um like I was looking online the, the the second that Charlie was really limping when he was coming out of the car, I was looking to see if people were like making connections between his dad and there weren't enough tweets about it. And I almost thought people thought it was like insensitive to talk about how he's limping like his dad. I mean, I thought it was the cutest damn thing I've ever seen in my entire life. The fact that his dad legitimately will have a limp for like the rest of his life. And then Tiger, I mean, and then Charlie's now walking side by side. I'm in a red shirt limping as, as much as his dad. That is the most cartoon character thing I've ever seen in my entire life. And no one was really talking about it. I just think everyone, and I, I include myself in this category is a little hesitant to tweet about the health of a 13 year old. Like, and then, and then it's like, oh, he's limping like his dad. And then, oh, why is his dad limping? Oh, it's because of a car crash. And then it is, it was, it just, there was a lot of speculation, not speculation, but a lot of talk surrounding this tournament in particular leading up to it about how much do we all really want to talk about Charlie Woods? How many, how big of expectation do we want to put on him? How much do we want to compare him to his dad? And and I just, I think a lot of people just didn't want to, just didn't want to go down that road because you can control what you tweet, but the people under it, who knows what they're going to say. Right. Yep. I agree. It sucks, but it's, it's, it's probably the most sensitive weekend for us because like i could tweet whatever about fucking tiger woods or jt or sergio or so you could whatever but when it comes to tiger and charlie and i feel like now charlie's at that age where he's sort of in between like the last couple of years he was like a cute kid and it was very clear that he was like a cute kid now he's sort of like uh uh he's doing uh, interviews like, turning into a person interviews and like ordering head covers from pardon my take which they say some shit on there so it's like He's clearly not an adult yet. He's only like 13 years old. When he's just a cute kid, everybody understands that. So you just kind of got to stay away from it. Make sure you don't say anything that's going to get you in trouble, I feel like, is what a lot of people were doing. But it was um, – I agree with you, Frank. It was like it was like adorable. He was out there limping around as well, like rolled his ankle. He's probably going after it a little too hard on the range or whatever because he's young and, and trying to rip through the ball and hit it a mile, which he did hit it a mile. I thought, um, to, Dan, your point of like going from – uh, the World Cup final, and then like at the Barcelona Scottsdale Bar, and then it was like fucking Falcon Saints were on or something, and everyone's like, "Who? Like, get What's out of here with the intensity that we just had with that World Cup final." Soccer doesn't always bring the heat. Sometimes it can be a boring, grueling one nothing game. That was just the most that's ever brought the heat. Yeah, Frankie, did it break through ever. for you? Like, did it? Well, soccer obviously. matter for you yeah i mean it's one of the greatest sporting events of all time there's no denying it i mean there was a chance every single time they crossed they call it half half what do you call it the half, yeah, half halfway line. like halfway. when they got to the other team's box what do you like, call it though it's not like the red is line it half field half, yeah, half field, field cross half line, center half center field. line i don't know yeah. um i mean every time they came in on an attack there was a chance to score there were saves insane saves on both ends yeah. Um, Argentina, Argentinian goalie was out of control, Sicko. but then Sicko. also like Messi had that one fucking rip of a shot at the top of that goalie's fucking head on the fr- the French goalie's head. So yeah, it was an incredible game. I hate that it ends in fucking penalty kicks. I know that 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 soccer douchebag Alexei, what's his name? Alexi Lawless. Lawless. <laughs> Lawless was like, and if you think this is a coin toss, you are you are massively mistaken. There is skill, there is strategy. It's mano y mano. I'm like, shut the fuck up, Alexi. I want to see the golden goal. I want to see a guy running around and he scores. The place goes insane, and then it's over. I, I don't want it to be penalty. It's got to be Lawless's last World Cup. He's tough. He's, He's tough to handle. Tough. Oh, don't dude. He's not a Yeah, he trend. is. He the reason why he sticks uh, around is because he makes guys yeah. like Frankie crazy. He does, man. When yep. he came on that screen, right. it was like, it's no coin toss. Like, shut the fuck up, dude. Soccer's never going to be cool in America. Just deal with it. Yeah, like I. Listen, I've said on this podcast that once America gets eliminated, I'm pretty much out on the World Cup. But I did watch the final yesterday just because. And it was incredible to the point where you almost set the watermark too high for an American like me. <laughs> yeah. Where it's like, now I want every game to be like that. And as soon as the games aren't like that, 
I'm flipping over to something else. So it was an amazing game. Like anybody who you, it's an undeniably amazing game. Um, is it ever going to be that watershed moment for America where we just accept this sport with open arms, bring it close to our bosom and start watching it on a regular basis? No, that's just, if it was going to happen, it would have happened already. But this, yesterday's game was undeniably great you need two titans of the sport to go at it on the biggest stage like i mean that you couldn't have asked yep. for a better a better um storyline than what the world cup got yesterday and i still i agree with you trent i don't think it's gonna take off it's not i mean the problem is we have to wait four years for it and yes it's gonna be huge in america but it's always just gonna be every four years it's gonna be big it's gonna drum up a lot of drama and everyone's gonna be talking about it and then it's just gonna go away especially after this, these next four years are extremely important for soccer, I would assume, in America because they have to somehow build off this and then lead up to the next four. You might get some young kids that are fucking obsessed with it now because of this. Yeah. No, I agree. And it's a bummer that we – it's a bummer that the U.S. team went out the way we did where it really wasn't that exciting. It was like we were down pretty quickly. We were down a couple. We got that one goal to make it within one, but then they scored right away. So, like, even if, you, if we would have lost in a game like yesterday's game, I think that would have done a lot for the U.S. soccer of like, holy fuck, we're like right there. It was chaos. It was mm -hmm. back and forth. You cannot dream that up. I know those guys, your favorite, Lawless and all that crew, they were calling it the greatest World Cup final of all time. Clearly not on this show. Dan's pretty into it, but none of us are that well-versed in soccer at all. So I don't know that we're in a place to be able to claim that that's the best. I don't know how you can really beat that. I do agree, like the PKs in the final seem a little bit um, ridiculous. I did like somebody's idea from a couple weeks ago of like making it six on six and then all of a sudden like four on four or something to see what happens. Uh, but man, the back and forth, that save in the 123rd minute by the Argentine goal. I was watching that over and over yesterday. And even like there was a, uh, it might've been Mbappe or somebody was wide open as well on like the back door. If he just gives a little through ball, I don't, I can't stand in soccer. I'll never be able to understand a couple of things they do. One is on a play like that, when he didn't get the ball back door, he just immediately goes like this and starts being like chirping, like, I can't believe he didn't pass it to me, like while the play is still going on. And then the other is that it's just accepted that they just lie on the ground forever. I get that, like, I get people bitch about them diving, and the diving even makes sense to me to a certain point because they get calls in the box all the time, and a PK will change the course of fucking soccer history. So the diving sucks. It's annoying, but I get it to a degree. I don't get this belief that they have to have that, like, they, when they do dive, they then lie there for 30, 60, 90 seconds like they're fucking dead, like they're never going to be able to walk again. And then they're just fine. They're just 100% totally fine, and it's like nothing happened. And Dude, I get like, it. Dude. Did you see that rub down that Mbappe got when he went down? I'd go down all the time if they were going <laughs> to. If they were going to rub my thighs like that. I mean, come on. That was that was best, one of the best massages I've ever seen. That was a graphic rundown. I felt like rubbed down for in the in the World Cup finals is, is amazing. But that Mbappe, him and him and Messi, right? The storylines, him and Messi being teammates at PSG, and then here they are with France is looking to go back to back. I don't think any bar on the planet outside of in France was rooting for France for whatever reason. The world just negative connotations towards the French. They can be assholes. They're they're uptight. They're they fucked up. Whatever time. you want to call them. They won last time, exactly. So they're going for the uh, for back to back, which I think is like never happened before. Where somebody's defended a World Cup. Usually they it's never even like get out of the years. Yeah, yeah. Usually they never even get out of the of the group stage. Here they are looking to go back to back, and then you got Messi, who's arguably the greatest player of all fucking time up there. The only thing not on his mantle, basically, is a World Cup final. Argentina is a powerhouse. That's all they want to do is win the World Cup. It's been forever. Maradona and the fucking comparisons. And him scoring two goals and an assist, and then Mbappe with the hat trick, and then both of them scoring their PKs. It was like just everything you could possibly fucking imagine. Uh, it was awesome. It was. I don't know that you can have much better sporting event than that. The only like a few of our Super Bowls that we've seen in our lifetime that were you know like the Brady comeback and some of the the handful of them that came down to the wire. But in terms of like country versus country, it's it's not like. Like, even in a Super Bowl, it's like those are all, you know, like they all are pretty much American guys at the end that are, like, going to play for the same team here. And it's like country versus country. It's, it's fucking France, which, like, people in France and the French will almost never really interact with the Argentines in South America. And here they are. Their country's going against each other. It's fucking awesome. It's just awesome.
And I think the once every four year nature, like if there was only yep. one Super Bowl every four years or one Masters every four years. But yeah, just to back up your point, it was funny with the guys lie on the ground. You could tell like when they actually want to get up, h- how much they're diving. There was a foul with like a minute to go in the game. And this guy, Kingsley Coman on France, gets taken out, like hard foul. The kind of foul that in normal circumstances, he would be on the ground for 90 seconds. But there was 30 seconds left in the World Cup final. So he just popped up and he immediately started running. It's like, yep. Okay. And it's it's very strategic they do it, right? Like if their team's getting fucking, if their team's up against it like Argentina was in the last 10 minutes and you get fouled, you lay down there for fucking five minutes and slow this shit down. But that, France is buzzing. It looked like if that game went another five minutes, they're going to win for sure. So, of course, like you said, he just got slaughtered. They're going to have to amputate his leg. He pops up in two seconds. And then you get somebody else, they get like a simple shoulder to shoulder that no human being on earth would be injured from. And they lie there for fucking 10 minutes. So that part, I think to Americans too, people that don't watch soccer a ton, that's always going to be hard to get over because we're used to fucking football and hockey tough and football tough and all this shit. Um, But it was great. It delivered as much as you could possibly deliver it. I got Argentina the second that Brazil went down at plus 360. They ended up winning the whole thing. Two of their last three games were in PKs. So it's like, it shows you how hard it is to actually fucking get a win. And then the every four years thing is, I mean, you got Messi, who's the player of the tournament, and he already said this will be his last World Cup. And he, so it's like, how are you the best player of the tournament? And you're like, yeah, the next World Cup that comes around, I won't be able to play in it. So it's just, it's crazy. It's fucking awesome. Um, you got to live somewhere, folks. You just, you just have to. That's Facts. just the way that it works. Facts. Might as well own it unless you are uh, more interested in paying someone else's mortgage, which seems like a mistake. It's a great time to buy when you are ready to buy. Cross-country mortgage listens, understands, and communicates throughout the entire loan process. You don't have to take our word for it or my word for it. You can take Frankie's word for it. Literally use cross-country mortgage. I saw our guy Scott Fawcett. I mean, he's going to be my guy because his episode's coming out of Fixing Frankie in a couple weeks. Wait, we got a video with him coming out? Yeah. Fixing Frankie. Fixing Frankie, he he really was one of the main reasons why I started striking the ball better. I mean, he did this alignment thing with me, and it fucking something clicked, man. It was insane. But um, obviously a loose cannon on Twitter. I saw I'm him tweet about unmute him if we're going to put out a video. I know. I I I'm I'm starting the video saying I don't condone what this guy does on Twitter, but I, he definitely <laughs> knows a lot about the game of golf. Um, at the he was tweeting about he was screaming at the Twitterverse about equities and loans and being like if somebody that you're buying a house from tells you that no matter what the price is that you can get your payment the same rate they're trying to take something from you he's obviously in the, in the middle of a home buying process he's fucking <laughs> he's driving himself insane tweeting out like like a lunatic but uh, the point that he's making is like there are a lot of shady people when you are getting money and you're you're taking out a loan or you, you have to have new equity coming in all this stuff i dealt with that with my guy i'm like bro you're saying a lot of numbers like i have to have this stuff for 30 years he's like this is what you're gonna have in 30 years this is what it's gonna cost everything is put on a paper for you and they talk you through a cross-country mortgage i wouldn't have been able to do it without them i swear that's a that's an honest truth uh they're the best they're just the greatest um it's been a few years now or year that frankie's been that close with them and always raves about them for a very clear and real reason see if you qualify today visit ccm.com slash barstool now cross country mortgage llc nmls 3029 all loans subject to underwriting approval visit www.nmlsconsumeraccess.org I found myself rooting for Messi because I know there's a lot of Messi Ronaldo talk about who's the greatest and Ronaldo is just a little bit too good looking for me. He's, he's got it all really. He's got, he's good looking. He's rich. He's now going to make $200 million a year with this Saudi deal. And Messi is, you know, he's not an ugly fellow, but he's, he's certainly no Ronaldo. So that was a win for, you know, the not model looking people of the world. You ever see Ronaldo's um, underwear? Like, of course. Uh, yeah. He's got a 10 pack. <clears throat> yeah, of course. He, um, I, I agree with me at Messi too is like five, five, basically right. he had to have growth hormones to even be able to like play the game of soccer. <laughs> so I agree with you. He's, uh, yeah, he's fucking great. You could see in the, in the, in the celebration, all that, which Qatar brought the thunder when it came to that whole deal afterwards, when they brought the world cup out, that whole presentation, I watched that again last night. That was like as, as theatrical of anything I've ever seen. It's like, Felt like they were crowning the new like Hunger Games, like World Leader. It was, <laughs> yeah. like, it was fucking wild. I was like, holy shit. The fireworks going off and it, it was wild. But, I always um, think the World Cup should be bigger. 
as a as a trophy. And I oh, like oh, yep. yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, just I it's cool. It's like is it pure gold? I would imagine that's just who knows. But yeah. it's just so tiny. It kind of doesn't look doesn't match the magnitude of the tournament in my opinion. I I agree. Just make it twice the size, same cup. Same thing, just like twice the size. Yeah. And it's, it's always cool. better if you can drink out of it. But if it's if not, just a little bigger would be good. Yeah, it doesn't do it for me. It's veiny. It's veiny. It is it? veiny. It's vascular. <laughs> it's extremely <laughs> veiny. We got, yeah. we got we got some we got some horny guys on the show today. It's, it's the, that's just a fact. <laughs> you carry you were in the middle of a porn sequence, and uh, the World Cup Championship trophy looks like a veiny cock. That thing's it's getting simple. put somewhere <laughs> for sure. <laughs> There was some big golf news. I don't, know if, I don't know if you guys saw this, but the COO of uh, of Live stepped down, which is actually I think kind of a big kind of big news. I did so not. I see saw that. I saw the um, one line. Uh, I, I was reading a quick article about it before the show. I didn't really see it until this morning, but one line was that like he, the the um, who was it Atul Atul Kosla. So they call this guy Kosla. AK. So every time it was I was sort talk- of like viewed as like the voice of reason is I think the line that I read. Yeah. So he was like the business mind. So when I would go to live and I would say like, who can I talk to about the business? Because like ostensibly there is a business plan here. They'd be like, oh, AK's your guy. AK's your guy. He, you, he was, he was the COO of the Chicago fire soccer team. Then he went to be an executive for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He was like chief corporate development, you know, just one of these guys who's been in sports business for a long time. I want to say definitely under 45, right? Like a young guy. Um, and 43. And just 43. Okay. So yeah, just like a smart, passionate guy. And I remember I went to him. I was like, so are, are you guys like trying to make money here? And he laughed. He's like, dude, I've worked in sports business for a really long time. Like I, I'm not here to like lose money on a business. I, I know that we can sell this thing. He was the one who was, who was telling me how important the franchises is and how it will resonate with American sports fans because they're used to rooting for teams and this thing is all going to work. And, Oh, I, I said to him, why don't, why are there no logos here? Why are there, why don't I not see a single corporate logo except for live? And he'd say, this is our beta year. We got to show them the product. Once they see the product, I was reading a little thing from Sean Zock from golf.com. He had interviewed him and, and a tool was saying, look, I'm going to sell this thing. I'm going to sell this thing. I'm going to sell. And now he's gone. And so now they've lost Sean Bratches, who was this guy resigned in May. He was the, chief corporate officer i think he used to work for espn for a long time so another voice of reason he's gone he resigned after norman said the khashoggi like we all make mistakes he, the brash is like that's one too far for me you now you got this that. guy AK, ak is gone and uh and there were there were reports a couple weeks ago that that norman you know they might be trying to push aside norman so you know you, you don't want to read between the lines too much but just objectively speaking that kind of turnover in one year at the at the very very high level is is definitely noteworthy what does the corporate flow chart at live look like now a tool a tool reports to norman and i believe that norman reports to this guy majed majed is the one who remember he's the one who said um i'll make my own majors if if they don't like us yeah mm-hmm. yeah so he runs he's the ceo of golf saudi which is like the government organization he is in mbs's circle so it's like mbs majed and this guy yasser but yasser yasser runs the piff which is the money it, it's all very sort of like you know they all kind of do everything the same but there's like the way i conceptualize it is there's there's mbs up here then you've got majed mm-hmm. and yasser here then norman and then you have these like a tool and bratch's guy who are both gone gotcha it's so, interesting that is interesting yeah i uh it, you know it, we've talked about it a lot but it is you know, we, we talked about once you get to the top and that's why that chart's important of like, it's bad, but you don't have to go that far below that to find people that genuinely wanted to create and want to create a good viable business and product. Totally. And a lot of that stuff, when you explain that to us, which you got from him, who's now resigned, made a lot of sense of like, no, no, they're like, they're committed and locked into the idea of the franchises and the teams and like, you know, when when Phil tries to recruit guys to his team, Phil has equity in the team that he's on and and, and they're trying to make that. So that actually I thought, oh, that is really fucking smart. Um, and I agree with the idea of like, don't sell the shit out of it right away. Let's like, you know, present a good appealing product that's not completely dominated and drowned out with ads right away. And then if people watching or interested in it, we'll get the advertisements going forward. But none of that really matters at this point because. He's fucking gone. So it'll be interesting to see, did I see obviously who they replace Dan, did, him with. Dan, did you tweet this morning that they're gonna be on TV? That was that was I no. 
They're not. That okay. was a, yeah, not yet. The, the, the rumors are still Fox, but again, it's December 19th and nothing, still nothing's happened. There's still no TV deal. There's still not a single corporate sponsorship, which again, maybe that's all part of the plan and, and you know, could be tomorrow that they announce all this stuff, but it just seems like they're having a really hard time selling this thing, which probably, you know, could have been predicted, but you know, the they stuff that makes the sense, stuff to the, yeah, the stuff that makes sense in a boardroom within a McKinsey boardroom, you know, and that doesn't always make sense in the real world and people don't always react the way that you think they're going to. So it'll be interesting to see who they, who they, um, re replace him with. He's definitely signed a really serious NDA. So I don't think we're going to get any, any sort of, you know, well, insight book, as to why he for the left. show, Jake Bass. I would, on. <laughs> I would be curious. If they if they do end up getting a TV TV deal, whether that's them paying a network or a network paying them, whatever, I would be very curious to see what the numbers would be, like and and especially interested to see what those numbers would be up against lower level PGA Tour events like that. That's the interesting stuff. Like we can go back and forth about whether or not they're going to get one, whether or not they should have one, whatever. But if they do end up getting put on American television, the numbers will be very very interesting. So. In a way, I hope that happens because I would. I just want to see what the numbers are because we've seen them what they are on YouTube. But you know, there's a disconnect with certain generations. Blah 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 blah. But on if it's on TV and they're like, "We're here. We are. This is the channel. This is when we're going to be on." Then I would be curious to see what the numbers are. I wonder how yeah. uh, TV too. programming works. That like you can just like like you're saying it's already December. Aren't there things scheduled for like the days that they want? Isn't, you think you so with just, Fox like, too? Right. Like, you can't just bounce things like that from like. Friday to Sunday. Right. It's insane. <clears throat> Unless you can. I don't know. You'd have to pay, I guess, like a shit ton of money to whatever program was already scheduled for like those slots. I mean, like all daytime on Fox. What are they Why don't they just go? They should go to like a non-traditional sports. Like PBS. just don't even, it doesn't have to be a sports thing. Just go to like Cartoon Network yeah, and like be like, sports, hey, or... we want to put on, we got a golf events we want to put on. We want to buy space during your, during your schedule. Can we do that? Barstool.tv and Sling. <laughs> All business I mean, beats I, I, out there running the golf yeah. broadcast. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, and then last thing I wanted to say before we throw it to Patrick Harrington is uh, I thought Tiger Woods' golf game looked pretty fucking good, to be honest with you. He was swinging it pretty fast. Uh, I thought he got ball speed up in like the 180s at one point or a couple different points. So um, we've done a lot in the last few months of like, we just need to get this guy a golf cart. We need to get this guy a golf cart. Seeing him actually out there playing pretty fucking well with a golf cart made me even more infuriated that he just can't walk. He was incredible. Yeah. He didn't just look great. He was incredible. <laughs> he outdrove he JT his out first, like, like he outdrove JT his first, like, eight holes that he had to JT drive said after the round, he goes, he 100% hits it further than me with driver right now. JT finished 14th in driving distance on the PJ Tour last year. Dude, his so, I mean, rhythm was insane. Here? His tempo was outrageous. His putting, their reads were kind of weird. Him and Charlie, like, just couldn't read some putts. Uh, yesterday was wild. That was strange. Like, Charlie would putt, like, a foot left and completely miss, and then Tiger would do the same thing. I was like, it was driving me insane. I saw that too. I, saw and that I was too. like, what are they doing? Like, clearly, you just saw the read and it didn't go that way, and you just I, trusted it. But I've got a um, new idea for Tiger though crutches. We've talked about yeah, that. It makes your like arms all fucking weird and shit. What do you I mean? really your think he, he doesn't want anything that makes him stand out? I know uh, he needs Which like sucks. he needs crutches. these people that are working on nuclear fusion to like work on like a robotic leg. That can just like maneuver his leg as he walks. You ever see the Dude, legs I'm that like you. can take your brain? What, what about you're the thinking? one where he like rolls himself and he's like bent his knee and it's like a roller? I I'm think he's that. out on that whole idea. I think he's just if he can't just walk like everyone else, he's I out. I think it's a cane. I think get him a cane. Imagine him out there like fucking Yoda. Fucking he walks dignified. out there with his cane, sets that thing down. Rips a drive past fucking JT and then picks up his cane and walks down the fairway. Come and on. Use it as one of your clubs. Like, take a club out of the bag and use Fine. the cane as one of your clubs. So it's he's within the rules of golf. Ooh, he kind of like, does that now. Yeah, but like an actual cane. One with like a little like a uh, poker at the end that can dig into like the into the mm -hmm. thick stuff. Or, uh, yeah, like, who's the guy in Jurassic Park? The doctor who's got that cane. He's right, a big cane exactly. guy that sticks out. He's got the bug in the end of it that led to the dinosaurs coming back. Dude, his short game was so good. There were some, like, 60-yard oh, shots oh, that he was hitting God. on the pin that were spinning right there. He was even laughing a couple times at how good he was. He was fucking club touring. What was that 200 and, like, 
25 yard four or five yeah, iron that he like hit down slope in the rough with the fucking fade around the trees and it went to like 15 feet <laughs> everyone's like so someone on the broadcast said that was like the greatest shot he's hit since like 2001 <laughs> yeah, roger Mal- roger malpy who was his last broadcast he was sitting behind in the in the, in the audio he goes oh is that pretty <laughs> <laughs> And Tiger <laughs> had the demeanor of a guy who still wants it. Like we can talk all about these reports and how he's playing well. And, you know, he's hitting the ball great. But if you just watch him, especially when he'll he buried a long putt, he's like, fucking right. I can still do this shit. So with all of that, we just got to figure out a way for him to get around. And I actually yep. love the cane idea because it's dignified. It's not a card is like, oh, look totally. at him. He's he, he needs all this help. A cane is just like everybody. People use canes. That's pretty common. So, yeah, we just got to figure out a way for him to get around because he can still play. And a lot of people are like, you know, he's not going to play that well in tournaments because he doesn't have Charlie playing for him. And I saw a lot of tweets being like Charlie carries him. Like Charlie could barely hit the golf ball. He was like hitting into the water every single tee shot. He could barely walk. The kid was limping all over the place. It was hard to watch at times. Top really, one. I, I saw him top and iron at one point. Can't believe you're like making this kid play, but obviously he wanted to. But it was hard to watch. He was in pain. And then you, you look at like the leaderboard and Tiger Woods tied Jordan Spieth and his father. Like, I mean. Tiger Woods did most of the legwork, no pun intended. And at the end of the day, this guy's hitting amazing golf shots. You just got to get him down from the tee box of the green 18 times for four straight days. We have to figure that out. He can hit the shots, though. If you get him there, he's going to hit the shots. He's always going to be contentious. We need like a task force. Yeah, we do. need a cane. We just need a fucking cane. I um, Shout out to the Sings, by the way. They were a problem the second I saw them on their way down to the PNC. Yep. They took that selfie, and I'm like... Fuck, VJ Sung looks like a problem. He really just looked like a problem from the second that they took that photo. And then, obviously, their first day, they lit it up, and it was over since then. And, obviously, he Team Daly is Cass, a dynasty. Cass hit that yesterday at that, like, 250-yard four iron to, yeah, to their like, problem. eight feet. It's like, fuck it, hey, VJ's looking long in the tooth again. He's just – he's he's gotten – he's over the over the hill at that point. He's not going to look young anymore. You know, he just yep. looked super old last yesterday. They were a menacing duo from the second that the whole thing started. They were just, it felt like they were going to win. But yeah, I thought Tiger Woods looked phenomenal. Get that guy a goddamn cane. Uh, I think he's going to play. I think we're going to see him play the Players' Championship. That's when I think is going to be the first time you don't he think plays. He's playing Riviera? I don't. Interesting. I hope I'm wrong, but I don't. I think he's going to play the Riviera? Players' Championship. Riviera is like Valentine's Day. Okay. Yeah. Do you think players he plays the players as like a show of four, as like a, a unifying um, event for the PGA Tour? I think that's going to be a factor in it for sure. I think too, he, you know, I think he does view the players as like, you don't just say someone has 62 PGA Tour wins and 15 majors. You say he has, you know, 15 majors, two players championships, 62 tour wins so, or 82 tour wins. So it's like, I think he views it that way. So I think that he thinks it's a legacy idea. I think that um, it's flat, right? Florida's pretty yeah, flat. TPC Sawgrass is a pretty easy walk. It's going to be warm. Whereas I think Riviera is chilly around that time of year. It's not, I guess it's not the craziest walk. You've played it. I haven't, but it's not, it's not the craziest walk, right? After the first, first hole and the you last hole, you go on crazy one, and then it's You it. go down on one and up on 18 and everything in between is dead flat. Man, I think I'll, he'll play. I'll play I think he'll That'd play. He, he's he's trying to make that event his event, like just like you know the memorials Jack's event, and Bay Hill was Arnie's event. Riviera, it's obviously it's thrown, it's put on by his foundation, but it's not quite his event yet. And I think him continuing to show up and him saying, "Oh, this is worth it for me to play." I think that I think it's in his interest to do that. I, but think, I, it's, I, I think it's his event. He made some headlines the last couple of times around that place, but I mm-hmm. think people are kind of like that's his event. But yeah, I hope he plays Riviera. That'd be like great. Event like there's like there there's was an event. event that occurred at at that area when he was there. Um, I hope you're right. I hope he plays there. But yeah, I think I, it, it gave me a lot of uh, promise because there's been a lot of the old course and him not playing well, missing the cut. And then people thinking he should retire when he walked across the Spoken Bridge. And then in the last several months, then he didn't look great. And he had to withdraw with the plantar fasciitis. And everybody's like, oh, fuck. Seeing him out there actually stripe the golf ball and hit driver farther than JT got me right back where I was basically at the Masters last Who's, year. Who said that? Colin Montgomery about him, yeah. that Tiger should have retired at the at the Open Championship? Keep, I need people to keep saying those things. We, we almost need to – we need industry plants to – give press conferences that are like this guy's done this guy it's oh even if like jt wants to do it tongue in cheek just it'll fire tiger up if he is at a press conference just like someone's like what do you think the the future looks like for tiger and he's just like washed that guy's done it's <laughs> never it's never coming back i think that fires tiger up so colin montgomery 
Keep coming, man. Keep Doug doing Ferguson it. had a reply to that tweet that only Doug Ferguson could have. And the headline was longtime rival Colin Montgomery says that Tiger Woods should have retired. And Doug Ferguson replies, he goes, Longtime rival is an interesting choice of words here is because unless I'm missing one, I don't think Colin Montgomery ever won a single tournament that Tiger was playing. <laughs> like, oh, I fair like play, stuff. Doug. I love play, stuff. Doug. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. I mean, I'll fucking do it if it'll fire if it means it'll fire Tiger up. I'll start tweeting that he's done. He should just retire. I'll just that's the only thing I'll ever say. If, it's, if it'll fire his ass up and he'll start fucking winning, I'll take one for the team. I don't care what it takes, but but yeah, you can't be out there like he should fucking retire. I the the from what I saw, I feel very optimistic going forward. That man can contend in major championships. We just got to get him through. It's going to re- uh, require obviously a week where his fucking leg feels pretty good. I think it's week on, week off with that thing. I think sometimes it's fine. Sometimes it's probably unbelievably sore. But there's a golfer in there, boys. There's a real golfer in there still. Shout out to Team Harrington. He's on today's show, right? We're going to get to him pretty soon. He, he, You got to watch it. If you've been listening to this, maybe in your car, on your way to work, you got to turn on the YouTube version of this for when Patty comes onto this screen because he's absolutely yoked up guns a blazing right in front of the fucking <laughs> camera it's the most insane thing i've ever seen in my entire life and then he went out and played really well at the pnc he said he's been playing really well he's been doing really well at the uh champions uh tour events so yeah it's been it's been pretty uh it, it was a really it was a really really good event i thought i i was pretty glued to it all weekend even with everything going on there was a lot of hockey on there's a lot of football on there's a lot of soccer on and i still kept watching not even just for tiger but it's always just it's always just fun to see these guys playing with their sons or their daughters or whoever because um, you see how good the families are at golf. Like Jordan Speed's dad is oh, no. just like sick at golf and draining like 70-foot putts and shit. It's like, I mean, I, you expect it, I guess, but you really it's, – it's fun to see because you're like, that's how they got there. That's how Jordan Speed's got always- like, the itch. Right, I'm always really surprised by Mike Thomas, and I know he was like a player back in his day. And he lives last for this year, event, though. What's that? He lives for this event for he's sure. Like, but he like last year, he could his back was hurt and he couldn't really walk. So it was like, man, he's kind of getting up there. And then yesterday, he's just throwing darts around. It was no, like, dude, they, the Thomases got to be like some of the more competitive people on the planet. Yeah. And you just, I mean, his dad's like right there on his back every single tournament that JT plays and taking videos, doing that that dad stance behind him you just know that like when pnc comes around he's doing his stretching in the morning like no one talks to daddy thomas like he's getting ready for his tournament this week and he takes it very seriously and he hits amazing shots amazing the guy was flag hunting all weekend long i love that smile once yeah doesn't smile that's the pose now like if you're taking a swing video of somebody you you gotta get in that pose yeah you gotta get the wide legs Crouch down a little bit, belt high. That is just the official. Pose. It's the coolest event ever, man. I just love. I love that his dad takes it that seriously because it is serious. I mean, what the things win like two hundred grand or something like that. I mean, like it's fun to like take home a check to play golf with your kid. It's like it's awesome. the coolest thing of all time. Tiger had the dad pose. Uh, like, of course, he did it. You know, harder than I've ever seen anybody do it. He was like <laughs> wide base and was out there getting that shot of Charlie. Legs look great so. there. Oh, really good. Dad Tiger um, uh, at times make me makes me emotional. When he he yeah. really likes being a dad. He genuinely does. Like I think he says it a lot and you always hear about it and he's like I just want to be healthy enough to play with my kids and you know see him grow up and you know he's had some tough times. But watching him out there uh, it's it's cool. It really is awesome to see how happy playing with Charlie makes him. I thought that was I mean that's what the event's all about but like when they're hugging on 18 it's like wow. That's that's pretty cool. It's the most human that he is, right? Like when we yes. see that, it's he's so media trained, and even in normal interviews, or even when Dan forgets what he's supposed to ask him, like he's still just very trained and comes off pretty robotic. And there, it's just a guy with his dad, which we see every day, everywhere. And you're like, oh, this guy's a real person. You can tell him and Charlie have an awesome relationship. They give each other a hard time. Yet Tiger's still out there. Tiger still wants to get footage on his phone of Charlie. He wants Charlie to like hit good shots because he knows it makes him happy it's like that's just so real and human of tiger exactly big time well said. It's fucking great it, it, um, you know okay. what um this, this is a weird i just want to say this. this is a weird like fucking comparison did you see that guy in the mavs um that first round draft pick he just retired he's like played 13 games he just retired because he just couldn't take the anxiety anymore of just being in the no. nba just he's like mm-hmm. i just can't take it just thought i'd like it and it's just like ruined me it's amazing what the pressure does to some people like i mean charlie right now going into this you think about he's just going to be ready for this right you just think because he's a woods he's just gonna go out and probably win majors it's like you don't realize 
that each person mechanically or technically in their brain, whatever's going to happen, how they're going to accept it. And, you know, one way you could go this way, they got in the Dallas Mavs or the other way you can be Charlie and like be really good in interviews and step up to the limelight. It is amazing that no matter how much talent you have, it doesn't mean that you're going to make it. I just thought it was crazy when I saw that come across my desk. You know what I find interesting about the Charlie Tiger relationship is that there's like Charlie knows who his dad is and knows some of the things that he's he listens done. To pardon my take. So he, I know this, jokes that, that actually him. kind of fucked up my whole view of of like what charlie knows and what he doesn't know but like he's gonna he doesn't know ever like it's it's kind of weird to say but we know more about tiger professionally than charlie does i don't know if that's true or not but like we i'm talking about tournaments and things that he's won things that he's gone through like and he, charlie's gonna learn those things and realize like who his dad really is like he, he realizes that his dad is tiger woods for sure that he's won 15 majors probably the greatest golfer of all time. But when you start getting into the details of like the 2008 U S open and all these things where he is, he is that dude, he is tiger woods, who is the greatest golfer of all time. That's really interesting to watch. And it's going to be interesting to watch that maturation process process as the PNC goes forward, just watching Charlie fully realize. And again, there's going to be parts of that that aren't great, but fully realize who his dad is. Yeah, that's a, that's a fascinating thing to think about someone in his spot, Charlie's spot, learning about your father. Because like you're saying, Trent, like we, we, all, we know more, I agree, in your opinion, because we lived it. We didn't have to go learn about it. We didn't have to yep. go study it. We didn't have to like try to download it to our program. Like we just witnessed it. We were there. Mm-hmm. We saw, we knew all the context in real time at the 08 U.S. Open, at the 2019 Masters, which he was obviously very much – uh, older and, and remembers all of that but but yeah he like finding that out and then what you talked about earlier finding it out in a different era where they have phones and access to the internet and whatnot all the time like i don't know how he understands all that he might have watched every fucking round tigers ever played on youtube he might he might have never wanted to look at any of it like we don't you know like the last thing right. in the world we ever want to do is watch ourselves on video so maybe he doesn't even want to watch his dad on video like maybe it's that kind of relationship to it uh, it's really interesting to think about. Yeah, there's like documentaries. There's like a one hour documentary uh, that goes through Tiger's uh, 2000 US Open when he wins by 15 shots. I've seen it's called like Perfection at Pebble. I've seen it 25 times. Has Charlie seen it? You know, know. maybe he has. Like Rick is saying, that's that's impossible to know. Maybe he yeah. digs into it. Maybe he doesn't. But at some, maybe he knows way more than we think. But it's yeah. I mean, his dad he seems like a cool kid. I'll say he that. Does. Like yeah. He gets it. He's he's like super normal. They, you know, he, this was the first year that he was doing interviews. He was very guarded because I remember we would ask last year. I was at this event the last couple of years and there was like no fucking chance. You're a creep. Get away from this kid. Now he's doing interviews and uh, yeah, just seems like a normal, cool guy. And I think it's a, a testament to Tiger's um, and Erica and Elon's t- parenting that he is like so normal yeah. and guarded. Not an easy thing to do when you're no. just a super rich, you know, uh, famous person's so it's just like that's just not easy to be it's, it's uh, historically you are put in a spot to fail totally yeah. totally right. uh so yeah really impressive i thought he's been really impressive uh and so was tiger so i loved it loved the pnc all right speaking of pnc the harrington's were there we got Padraig harrington who three-time major winner was just the european Ryder cup captain uh we spoke about a lot of cool things and he's a great dude so let's throw it to Padraig harrington Today's episode is also brought to you by our good friends, our pals over at Whoop. They are the official fitness wearable of the PGA Tour, of the LPGA Tour. If you don't know by now, Whoop is a sleek, screenless fitness wearable with a companion app that tracks and breaks down your daily sleep recovery and activity. Whoop tracks all the same fitness data as the conventional fitness wearable, but really specializes in analyzing trends and data points around your recovery and sleep, and then gives you information that you need to know about where you're at, your body, your data, how you're doing with recovery and sleep, and your strain on a day-to-day basis. I'm in a little group with my pals, and we're obsessed with it. My buddy's back home, my brother, friend JR, Mike, we're on the Whoop uh, in this group and we pretty much compare every single day how we're doing actually kind of motivates us to be a little bit better about it especially during the week when you got work to do you're trying to uh be at your best or at least be sharper than you otherwise might be trent and i talk a lot about how you mislead yourself sometimes and how often you think you're sleep sleeping and the kind of rem sleep that you think you're getting 
It really does. Yeah. It'll, you'll think you slept for eight hours and it'll tell you that you slept for like six and a half. So you might be lying to yourself about how much sleep you're getting. And I don't want to bring it up again, but my strain on Friday from carrying a dog up three flights of stairs was, was much higher than it usually is. So this thing tracks it, you know, whether you're working on a treadmill, whether you're being a hero in your apartment building, whatever it is, it's going to track things very, very closely. And you'll know much more about yourself. My goal, my goal for 2023 um, is going to be to have, I would say on average, at least five days a week where I'm 80% or higher on the recovery. Okay. That's one of my goals for 2023. The, you, the booze, this booze is what gets you. Booze is devastating. I woke up 1% yesterday oh. uh, before we went to the um, World Cup final at Barstool Scottsdale. The nice thing about getting up and uh, uh, getting after that early is that by the time you're ready to go to sleep and you're exhausted and whatever, it's only like two o'clock in the afternoon, which is nice. Um, so I got a lot of sleep last night, recovered quite well. Point is, that's not going to be sustainable long term, and Whoop's going to help us tell that. So uh, next year, I'm going to have to, on average, five days a week. There's a couple of days where I'm going to be able to live my life, but try to have the recovery high because you can very much clearly tell from the data how much better it is for you as a person. Go to Whoop.com. That's W-H-O-O-P.com. Enter code four to save 10% off any membership today that's whoop.com enter the code for f-o-r-e and save 10 percent off any membership today ladies and gentlemen we're joined by a very special guest for the second time actually i think like six years ago we had Padrick on and we he was across the pond and there was a big delay we were able to cut it up to an interview that was digestible but i'm glad we're able to have it back now things have changed dramatically three-time major winner there's dan joiner right now as well Ryder cup captain for team europe last year Padraig harrington uh rejoining the show and we were just chatting a little bit but you're coming to us from the pnc championship it sounds like yeah i'm, I'm delighted actually because europe uh, certainly ireland the weather's terrible at the moment we've got a bit of uh we get snow maybe once a year and we're getting it at the moment. So being in uh, Orlando, Florida, even the forecast isn't great here, but it's a lot better than home. So I'm happy to be here. I saw some pictures of St. Andrews covered in snow. I, I imagine that was sort of the same storm that hit Ireland. Did you live in, in Florida f when you were in your heyday forever? No, I never moved uh, to the States. Kind of, I kind of take the attitude, if I moved and I brought my, say I brought my wife and family here and then I went to a tournament, I'm leaving my wife where she has no social oh. structure. Whereas if I if, if I'm at home for three weeks now in Ireland, my wife will literally kick me out the door. Like, come on, <laughs> why you're 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 ruining the routines, all the things. Because she has her, she, her. We live within ten minutes of my family, her family, her sister. She has all her friends. So I I think for a professional golfer, particularly because of the amount of travel we do, you're better off living where your wife is from. If you want a happy married life, if you want to, like, it, there's no doubt living in the sun is better for your golf. I, 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 you know, living on a golf course, being able to go out and practice on a golf course, because practicing on a driving range is, is quite close to effectively useless. It might even be harmful. So practicing on a golf course, and I know green keepers don't want to hear this, but the way I learned my game and the best way to learn it is go play nine holes in the evening time with three or four golf balls. It's interesting because I, uh, I view you, I, I, I very much admire, um, well, just being a fan of, of yours forever, I admire your, um, I would say, kind of the way that most people can relate to you because you're a constant tinkerer. And most players that are weekend golfers, we always talk, every single golf swing I take is a different golf swing. And so when we watch players that seem robotic and they seem same golf swing from, you know, 25 years ago, uh, and I'm sure there's a lot of those same characteristics in you, but you're posting tips, you're constantly tweaking. In 2017, you came out and you're stepping through your golf shots. We love that, I think. Yeah, I, I did actually record 15 or 16 videos for, for my Paddy's Golf Tips here yesterday. So they'll be going out Amazing. through next year. Wow. I I will tell the truth. I love to think about golf. I'm a golf nerd. I'm a golf pervert. I just like golf and everything that goes on with it. I'm curious to what other people are doing. I'm curious what I'm doing. But saying that, I do need to keep it in its right box. So <laughs> if, I, if, if, if I describe this to you, can you imagine having two brick walls? One is your technical swing 
and one is your mental game. Well, every time you work on your technical swing, you're taking a brick from your mental game and putting it into your technical game. So you're all, if you go working on your, your technical game, it's left brain, you're scrambling for thoughts, you are damaging your mental game. There's no doubt about it. And of course, if you work in your mental game, it's quite possible working on your mental game only will make you a better player. But the problem with the people who have only had a mental game all their career, when something breaks, they don't know how to get it back. So it, it isn't a perfect model to be always in the mental side of the game. It's certainly a poor model to be only in the physical side of the game, technical. But remember, that's what we enjoy. And I, I used to get into rows with amateurs. I actually physically get, lose my, not, yeah, get angry because I'd be telling them how to improve their golf. This is early on in my career. And I didn't realize that a lot of golfers actually don't want to improve how they, they're scoring. They want to hit the golf ball better. They're quite happy to sacrifice being a, a, a more competitive player. They lose their, their bets on the weekend in order to hit pure golf shots. So there's a high section of golfers that are more interested in swinging the club well, hitting the golf ball well, and the purity. And then you have a few who are only interested in scoring. It's like your putting, Riggs. It's like your putting. It's just amazing how true that is. I think... From any average, you know, weekend golfer, which I think we try to represent, it is such a better experience for whatever reason mentally. If you go out there and you play around where you're like, you know what, I just hit the ball really well. And yeah, maybe I feel like I should have shot 76 or 77, whatever your skill level is, but I actually shot 83 because I scored like an asshole. But guess what? I feel good. I found it. I figured it out. I'm swinging the club well. That, for whatever reason, leaves us with such a better taste in our mouths than the other way around. I'd say there's 90% of golfers like that, but there are 10% and and we all know them. There's they're re- they're some really competitive guys that just get the job done. There's some that are got hooky handicaps because they want to win. There's plenty of guys that are just interested in score. Uh, you even see that a bit on tour. I, I, I know good players on tour and maybe good players who didn't quite make it on tour, I would say, that kind of believe if they didn't hit the ball, if they missed a fairway or missed a green, that they deserve the bogey. That never crossed my mind in my career. I, I had no preconception that if you played a hole badly that you shouldn't get up and down. That's not right, you know. And and I, I was all about the score very much. And that's probably why I became quite obsessive about my swing because that <laughs> bit was missing. Uh, have, you, have you always been that I will way? Say, well, yeah, kind of. I, I grew up, there was no practice ground in my golf club. So, you know, I could only practice my chipping and play on the golf course. Uh, it was very windy golf course and, and poor weather. So you, you just didn't, you know, it wasn't conducive to being a nice swing. It was, you couldn't, And it was a tricky course. You couldn't hit nine greens in regulation any day. So to shoot on the par, you were shooting. I was shooting on the par around that golf course, hitting six greens in regulation. And and that's just my skill set. I was winning. I, I was always gambling, you know, trying to uh, look. If anybody wants to get better at golf, at any sport, if there's something on the line, they will, they will reset to how do I get this done? So if you're playing for, as I would have as a kid, I would have played for a golf ball or a Coke. You know, you, you know, when I would have played for a pound, like a dollar back with my brothers and five dollars. I remember one of my brothers, like he's 10 years older than me, actually the nine year old year older brother. He pinned the pound note up on the wall for at least five years. The last pound he won off me. Just to <laughs> make the point. And, and, and he did the classic, uh, what do you call it? I call it a bustle at home where he got in my head. Did the classic one. I missed a, a, a birdie putt of about four feet on the fifth hole, nine hole match. And as I'm going to tap in the like two footer for par, we don't play gimmies. By the way, if you want to be a golfer, I never play gimmies. Okay. I'm sorry to say you don't even get to be in the conversation if you play gimmies. So I'm trying to tap this two footer in. And he says, That's a shame. There's no more birdie holes. So straight away, my mind starts wandering. The seventh hole, two holes later, is a reachable par five. I'm like, what's he saying? I'm going to birdie the seventh in my head completely. And I missed the two footer. Just <laughs> the perfect hustle. Just get in somebody's head and make them think of something that they shouldn't be thinking of at that time. We do this series here with Trent, who's on the podcast with us. And he um, is doing a thing called Breaking 90. He's never broken 90 in his life. So, And we play ball and hole. And it's been an amazing, eye-opening experience at how 
much more difficult it is to play the game of golf when you are putting everything out as opposed to the relaxed out with your buddies. Like I would call it, I guess, American version of golf that we've like come to play where we just anything that's around the hole, you're playing for a match anyway. So you just don't even care. You scoop it up. But if you're trying to find out how your game is improving, if it is improving, getting that ball in the hole is so much more difficult than anyone realizes until they do it. And he does not get enough credit for attempting to lower his handicap while doing that. Well, and the response from people has been um, they will go out and try it and they realize that they're not a mid 80s golfer. They're a low 90s to maybe even mid 90s golfer when you take the gimmies out of it because putting everything out, like Frankie's saying, is much, much, much more difficult. And it makes a five footer, like a five footer is not a guaranteed two putt. Right. Whereas right. if you're just playing, a, if you're playing, a, if you're playing with gimmies, you're like, well, I'm going to try to bury this five footer. And if I miss, like we're just going to the next hole, even that five footer when everything's got to go in the hole, if it's a little downhill left to right, or you're a little more tentative and that just adds up over five, over 18 holes. It's so true. If, if some, like I get a lot of guys and they'll say, Oh, I have a really good player at my club. I'm sponsoring him. I think he's going to make it as a pro. You know, and, and I'm trying to fish out a bit of information about him. One of the first things I will ask is, does he play with gimmies? Does he give himself <laughs> puts when you're playing? With him? If if he if he plays with gimmies, he's not going to be a pro. It just it, it is a fundamental part of the game that you must take responsibility for those two and three footers uh, if you want to be a competitive player. Because I can guarantee you, if you were playing against your buddy and you were playing for a million dollars, he wouldn't give you that three footer. Right. right there, you go. Yeah, I. Uh... That's so true because when you watch, when the coverage of big tournaments starts to narrow in and you actually get to see people have to hit every shot all the way down to putting everything out, when they line up those two and a half, three footers in the back nine, you kind of you kind of sit there while you're watching like, oh God, if they, because man, those are not gimmies like we're saying. And if those miss, it starts to derail you. You lose confidence. The next one's not good. You want to come to the Champions Tour, okay? Because <sighs> everybody, everybody on the Champions Tour has something going on in their game. And it, it's actually, for people to learn, it's phenomenal how good the players are because everybody's carrying a crutch. We're at that age in our careers. There's a many a guy in the Champions Tour, and when they put up to two and three feet, they either run up and hit it, <laughs> or else they sta stand there hoping that somebody's going to give it to them. As in, they really don't <laughs> want to hit it. Because that's the nature. We've got to that stage that, you know... It's difficult for us, you know. There's a bit of nerves involved, so it's phenomenal on the Champions Tour that it the it's possibly the longest time to hit a putt as a three footer, rather than like a fifteen footer. Ah, it's no problem. We'll knock that up 25, 30 footer, no problem. But three footer, oh, you got to grind over that. You got to line it up. You got to get the line lined up. Yeah. You got to be careful. So yeah, it it, it, it it I will say, give me speed up play, no doubt about it. And if you're having a bit of fun. We see it in the pro-ams. It's really great in pro-ams that they play shambles a lot where you play off the best drive. And and I think that's the greatest way of playing golf for amateurs. Why why would you come out to a, a, a nice golf course pro-am and spend all day looking for your golf ball and hacking around in the trees when if you play shamble where you play off the best drive, everybody enjoys the day. Everybody has birdies. And, and golf should be more like that in the social context. We uh we know a guy really well, uh, Alistair Doherty, who we kind of support. And he just got his Corn Ferry Tour status going into next year. He gets his first eight starts. I play with him quite a bit out here in Scottsdale. And every hole, no matter what, if he's got a two footer, a four footer, he always says like, "Sorry, fellas, I got to go through my process." And he does as quick. Doesn't take overly long, but way longer than the rest of us who just fucking slap at it and then keep moving on. He does his quick aim point. He lines that puppy up and he buries it every single time. And it's exactly because of what you're talking about. I, I, had, a, I had a sponsor when I when I first came on tour. Uh, company sponsored me, but the individual, as you always know, it's always an individual behind it. And uh, he used to play golf and hustle all the amateurs. Because he, he had a bit of money, so he didn't mind doing it. He was a decent player, like a one handicap, and he'd have outrageous bets with the guys. And, and you know, you know, be a couple of hundred pounds at the time. He'd have a like a, I think he had a five thousand dollar hole in one prize. Must be paid in cash the next day. Must be paid. And like these are struggling pros, so they if they won it, it would be the greatest thing ever. If they put the pressure, and he was just hustling, hustling out. We beat nine times out of ten. We were making our money out. Like we were, we were making our pocket money as as at that stage, young pros. But the one time we lost, we might lose seven hundred pounds, and it would be pain. 
<laughs> you mentioned you mentioned the Champions Tour. I'm I'm looking at your record here. You, you dominated this year. You had four wins. You had four second place finishes. You averaged 309 yards off the tee, which is the longest on the senior tour, which probably isn't a surprise. Are you just pure distance? Are you as long, longer now than you were in the 07, 08 range? I'm longer. I'm longer. I'm, I'm in the same. I'm probably in the same category as I've always been. So when in 07, I would have been at the top end of the good players but I wouldn't have been as long as the big hitters. But the big hitters, we had all convinced the big hitters. It was like a mass psychosis. We convinced all the long hitters not to play like long hitters. They were all wrong to hit the ball driver. So all the long hitters right. up until Rory, Rory came. Even even DJ, uh, Bubba, JB Holmes, all those guys were long hitters. But they played and hit irons off the tee to where mm-hmm. we hit drivers. It was only when Rory came out and just kept hitting drivers that all of a sudden, what you're allowed to do that, you can do that, mm-hmm. you know, and and it wasn't done. I swear to you, all the long hitters up until 2011 tried to play golf like the medium hitter. They didn't let, didn't have a goal. Now, I would think it's pretty tough. If you're a young kid going out there, you've got to be really, really good if you're not a long hitter because well, it's hard, hard to beat 50 or 60 long hitters. That's what I was going to say is I think that coincides with the shot link data and with just understanding strokes gained and and how closer the hole is better. And I was going to ask you, you know, you're someone who's very well versed in this stuff. I think that the college kids who are coming up now might be on the whole longer than players on the PGA Tour. Do, Do you see a future? Yeah. Do you see a future where 315, 320, 325 is the new 300 yards? Yes and no. I haven't seen any benefit in being longer than one, 190 seems to be 190. 180, 180, 185 within yourself is the, is is absolutely optimal. Low low mid to one low to mid one eighties within yourself. So you're not trashing at it. You're you're a king. I think once you get higher ball speeds, you're starting to struggle with spin control. Can you imagine standing over a four iron? Like if you're if you've got like two hundred mile an hour ball speed for your driver, you're standing over a four iron. You could hit that with a cut, too much spin. You might hit it 220. And then the next shot you might draw it, you're going to hit it 255. That's 35 yards on the same shot. Whereas you get somebody who was great in my day, say Tim Clark. Tim Clark would have a three hybrid and he hit that thing. He'd be trying to hit it 220. And no matter how he hit it, he hit it 250. And if he absolutely killed it, he hit it 222. He hit a seven yard gap between his distance. So it just... As much as we want to be long off the tee, I think there is a sweet spot. Just a sweet spot when it comes to controlling the irons. And plus, they can't make the golf courses too long. Because remember, the short hitters are always the ones who are going to complain if the golf course gets long. So you still have to cater for everybody. So Rory is easily the best driver in the game. And to be honest, he's probably the longest in the air because of the way he's he's unusual that he's actually very fast and efficient. That's a very unusual combination. Usually the short hitters are efficient, uh, but Rory's both. So he's pitching it like 325 in the air. He's an unbelievable driver. But if you gave me Rory's length, I don't know if I could play with him. I just don't think I'd have the, the, the wear it all to take some of the lines that Rory takes on. And, you know, again, the new kids coming in. The one thing I would say, if you have 50 of these kids playing in the tournament. One's, one's going to get hot, right? Like that's the pro- Yeah, yeah. E- even if he's not, even if, what we're seeing more, and this is the like I would have said, even from 2011 onwards, when Rory came along, it had a big, big effect on me because up to that, I would tee up and go, if I play my game, I I, I win. I wasn't looking over. Okay, I was. Look, everybody was looking over their shoulder at Tiger, but outside of Tiger, we you know we finish around. We we if you had a good score, you'd be putting in your thing, and you're trying to be disciplined. Oh, it's all about me. And you have a sneaky look. What the Tiger shoot? What the Tiger shoot? Because, <laughs> you know, but. I believe my game was good enough to win at that stage. Then when Rory comes along, you're going, how can I beat this guy? He's hitting it 30 yards further down the fairway. You know, it just looks... Now, there's 50 guys like that. Not quite like that, but there, there's a lot of them out there. And the problem with that is these 50 guys, they're not all great players, but on their day, they're great players. And, the, you know, one out of those 50 is going to seem unbeatable. And that, oh, that yeah. is the problem. It's... It's the seeming of being unbeatable because we know holding a good putt or hitting a good wedge makes up for a lot. Right. But it feels, I, feel, you feel inferior. 
I saw a very a recent uh, Marco Mira clip going around from a um, like a instructional seminar kind of thing from years ago, and he was talking about when he first started playing a bunch with Tiger, and he said the two things that blew him away when he played a bunch with Tiger were one that he was always pin high, always, and he's like even if he wasn't trying to smoke it by everybody, whatever, he was always pin high. And the other thing he said was his speed on the greens. He said even if he didn't make everything every day, his speed on the greens was always phenomenal. And that putting is way more about speed than line. And he said those two things to him compared to all other pros he played with added up to where he was just going to be several shots better pretty much every time. Look, I heard had everything at the best level. He was the best driver in the ball. He was the best iron player. He was the best putter. He became a great pitcher of the ball. He became a great bunker player. He was always phenomenal chipper. But imagine having the talent, which loads of kids do, and then having Tiger's attitude. So Tiger like had, you know, he just there was no he left no shot out there. It killed him to drop a shot. So even if he was making a double bogey, it was the best double bogey he could make in that hole. So he had you know, the game and the talent, but he played like he was, you know, had a chip in his shoulder, had a, you know, was, was, it was, he played like one of those players that, you know, was getting the most out of the game and he was already the best. So he had the two qualities that tend to make, you know, in different degrees, make up a professional golfer. Some are very talented and some are unbelievably competitive. Tiger had both of those put together, which so- is unusual. We have though we have talks about Tiger all the time on the show about what really made the man and the golfer, what made him such a great golfer. And you're, are you saying that you think that are there people out there as talented as him? They just don't have the same type of mental ability that he does. I, I, I definitely there's there's lots of players out there that are incredibly physically talented. I think it's easier to be that way now. Yeah, you know, just better coaching. There's better equipment. Everything is better now. I think Tiger was easily two steps ahead of everybody in every different department back then. But the the, the defining point for me with Tiger was just his sheer drive on the golf course. Yeah. Every day he just – and in some ways it knocked the edges off him a little bit later on in his career because – I prefer the 2000 version of Tiger because he, he he went after a lot of shots and he'd hit miracle shots and it was exciting. Then he realized, you know what? I can be patient here. And he played a lot to the middle of the green. He played steady, hit more irons off the tee. You know, he just knew he'd keep himself in the tournament because that's he was winning tournaments that way. I think if he was pushed more, I think he would have gone back to being the, the, the player of 2000, of the late 90s of hitting golf shots. The one thing you didn't want to do with Tiger is poke the bear. I know he's called the Tiger. Maybe poke the Tiger. He, you know, if you wanted to beat Tiger, you kind of just hung in there. Just stayed with him, hung in there, did your thing, and hoped to be in the right place at the right time at the end of the round where you could make a birdie, just catch him off guard. You would, just... The last thing you wanted to do with Tiger was get a two, three shot lead after nine holes because you <laughs> knew he, he was going to come at you. Or have a, the... have a rules official kind of step in. Do you remember the 2009 WGC Bridgestone? Do a, do a walk. But look, he hit the greatest golf shot probably ever hit in golf on that 16th hole. I, I, it was 192 yards. I think he hit I, – I, I, somebody says he might have hit an eight arm. So there, but it, it, like, I quizzed him on this in my old job. I asked him. I said – we were. I was quizzing him on all his wins, and I said, at the 2009 Bridgestone, you hit a shot to six inches on the 16th hole on Sunday to beat Patrick Harrington. What club did you hit? He said, I hit eight iron. It was 180 yards. We were on the clock. That's what put Patty off. He had to play quickly, and he made a mistake. I, absolutely. We, you know, I was never, I've never been a quick player. My style of golf being a bit erratic and all that, and I'm obviously somebody who got it. So I'd be aware of my my pace of play and stuff like that. And we were finishing we were every going ding dong, no matter what. <laughs> we were pretty going ding dong at it. I, I actually, I really liked playing with Tiger. He was very easy to play with. He only said good shot to you when you hit good shot, which was great. There was no bull- bullshit about it. Like, it was just straightforward. We're here to play golf. And he really wanted to beat you by playing better than you. He knew, there was nearly a sense that he wanted you to play well, just to make him play well. So he was a very easy. There was no messing with him. It was so straightforward playing. With, and obviously, then you're inside the bubble. 
which is a lot easier than being outside the bubble. But yeah, that one in thing, yeah, he hit the greatest shot ever, and and, and no doubt, I I I would, my whole life I would say I'm really good at handling the pressure and not getting affected by by my playing partner doing this. But like I chipped it in the water afterwards. When do I ever chip it in the water? And then not alone did I chip it in the water, and I'm going to tell you this in a minute. I made an idiot myself and dropped it the far side of the hazard when I could have dropped it where I was chipping from. I forgot the rule. <laughs> he, he just had you all I, over I, the place. I, I was. It was the greatest shot I ever saw. And yeah, is that, is that the first time you've admitted that you just you 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 bobbled the rules after like you were so rattled? Is that the first time that you've actually said that out loud? <laughs> Well, I, I said it to my caddy that night, like we, we realized that. And, and he, obviously, he, he, you know, he, he, my caddy is about the coolest customer in the world. So he didn't spot it either. But uh, yeah, look, yeah, I think I was rattled. Yeah. And, 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 and my record with Tiger was pretty damn good. I, I, you know, when I play with Tiger, I, I, I have shown up very well. As I said, I've enjoyed it. So that was the one day that, you know, as I said, he was capable of when his back was to the wall, Tiger was capable of doing anything. And that was, that was when he was at his most dangerous. You kind of, to beat him, you just had to hang in there and lull him into a false sense of security. You know, that you're, you're, you're just hanging around. It's like, we're actually talking about a real tiger. When we talk yeah. like that. Yeah. Right. It's like an animal. <laughs> yeah, true. Uh, I know. It, look, he, 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 I, I do think, by the way, I think the media destroyed his driving. 100%. He was a phenomenally he was a phenomenally good driver of the ball. Very straight. So you can imagine he was hitting the ball 30, 40 yards past most of the field. So that meant his angles and lines were all the always across dog legs. So he, he looked like he hit the odd wild shot, but he didn't. And, and nearly always hit the middle of the fairway on a par five. So he was a great driver. But the media used to play up, I think, you know, get into his head about it. And you'd even see like for me, you could see later on, he hit hit a few drivers at time at, at that period, maybe two thousand and six onwards, where you know there was it was like the is it two thousand and five Hoy Lake where no it wasn't two two thousand and three oh uh, six oh six Hoy Lake where he hit the irons. That was the greatest performance ever, but in some ways it was like it was held against him that he wasn't able to hit drivers. And I, you would see later on in his career, he'd hit driver the odd time, and it was nearly like to prove that he was a good driver. He was a great driver. I'd pick him in 2000, I'd pick him as the best driver of the game ever. Yeah. Maybe until Rory came along. It is true. Like when you go through the final round in 2000, which I've clearly done a million times at the uh, US Open, Pebble Beach, he steps up several times in that final round and just rips driver with the ocean all down the right and he's completely fearless and he absolutely roasts that thing but i was gonna say you you've rattled some guys too what comes to mind for me is 2007 carnoustie sergio garcia when you took him down and my household was not sergio garcia household at all so when, <laughs> when he lipped out that putt to win the open championship we went crazy and then they replayed that clip of you and him passing each other and looking at each other. So you've gotten the better of some guys in some intense moments before. Yeah. yeah. As I, as I said, I, I was better in those intense moments. There's no doubt. Put me with my back to the wall, put me in the pressure situations. That's when I played my best. The Sergio went down 18. You know, I obviously messed up 18 and, and thankfully I went on to win the playoff because it, that could have, could have hurt me badly. Uh, and thankfully, I went on to win more majors. So it wasn't, you know, when you mess up the 72nd hole, it kind of puts an asterisk on things. Uh, but, you know, you kind of look, Sergio coming down 18, he's possibly the best driver of the ball in the game in 2007. Very long, very straight. And he, he hit an iron off the tee to leave himself 270 yards into that green. Like nobody would want 270 yards into the 18 green at Carnoustie. Like you can pitch it on that green and go well bounce. Like that's, it's the hardest shot in golf. So he, you know, sometimes, you know, he had a strategy that week, but that's why you can't always have a strategy. You know, people are, they always ask this on a Saturday night at tournaments, you know, what's your strategy going to be tomorrow? And you go, well, I'm going to hit the right shot at the right time. Depends where I Doesn't hit mean it. I'm going, <laughs> yeah. You, you can't turn around and say, I'm going to hit play safe off every tee because some stage you, you've got to take it on. 
and some stage you've got to back off it. So you can't say, I'm going to be aggressive all day. Every day you've got to hit the right shot for the right occasion. And Sergio had been playing with an iron. It had worked very well for him for the week. But if there ever was a time he could have broken the hole with one shot, if he hit driver off the tee, which I was trying to do and I messed it up, but if you hit the shot, you know, the 18 hole is one of those golf holes. It's incredibly difficult. But if you hit a great drive, you've completely broken the back of the hole. Like, it, it, you know, it was probably a drive and a seven iron that day where it laying up, he 270 trying to hit a three iron with a burn just short of the green, outbounds left, outbounds long, and you can't hit it right. Doesn't sound very pretty, does it? No, no, <laughs> no. Yeah, because I remember when Tiger and Molinari were in that final group, they both hit driver and had like a flip wedge into that into that green. Now, obviously, things are different with the wind, yeah, but, but still. We, we, we were hitting in 2000, what year was that? Two, Seven. That's 29. No, oh, yeah. not oh, 18, 2018. 18. Like, yeah. We know? were hit we were hitting it in the burn on 18. Like you were driving into the burn that we were trying to hit like a drive and a four iron over. I forgot how firm it was. So, yeah. It was just just that's Lynx golf. You you turn up and the, and the RNA are quite good. They say, Well, whatever the weather delivers, you're getting. We're not gonna do anything, you're gonna get whatever turns up. So it was burned out. They don't mind if we shoot 20 on the par. And if we shoot four over par, they're quite happy to. Uh, that 07, 08, you win three majors in, you know, 13 months or so. Was that, I'm starting to gather that that might not have been, you know, necessarily this this physical peak of your game. But was that, was that to you like pretty mental? Were you just mentally believing that you were going to win these tournaments? Yeah, I, I, I lost, like everybody, a lot of people have a hard luck story, 2006 Open, US Open at Wingfoot. I had three pars to win and hit three good tee shots. Like, you hit three good tee shots and you hit three, like, you, I cannot tell you how bad a, a bogey I made on, I missed the 16 with a five-arm bogey. First chip of the day, I hit a bad chip. I took three from 20 feet on 17, and then I three put the 18. Mm. Like, oh. both. I remember walking off, I was going up through the, the bleachers, went up and there's a beautiful lawn there, shale pattern. I walk up to the clubhouse wing foot and Bob Bertel is standing outside. I'm working with Bob Bertel and he's there to take the shoelaces off. He is genuinely <sighs> worried that I'm going to... And I smiled at him because it was the first time in my life that I played a major where I'd finished it and gone, I could have won this by myself. Whereas up to that, I was hoping to win a major and I was hoping that I'd hold a few long putts, I'd get a bit lucky or somebody else would mess up. But I couldn't have scored worse that week than I did. So I knew walking off at wing foot, that was the first time that I went to a golf course. And after that, where I walked around a major and I wasn't looking over my shoulder. I wasn't worried about what anybody else was doing. I was going, if I play my game, I'm going to be in contention. If I do that twice a year, so if I do it, play my game in four majors, I'll be in contention. I play well three. I'll be in contention two. And I said, you know, maybe I'll win one in every two, every, one in every four. So, you know, I was kind of working like that. But when the minute you're comfortable, that's when you start winning. And guys, I know it's changed now with the young guys, but up to my career, pretty much every golf career lasted 20 years. And they all had two seasons, about 18 months where they peaked. And if you look at everybody, they all had that. And what we're seeing now is the young guys are having that two season, 18 months early on. Yeah, like 23 or no, 24. But, but remember this, once you peak, never, never is good again. Uh, it's very, very few. You'll only find an outlier somewhere that has peaked twice because you're trying to live up to how you think you played, which isn't the reality. Remember, you know, everybody looks back at their golden period and think they never hit a bad shot. That's not true at all. So, it's really hard to live up to that period. And look, you can see it. You'll get guys who make a tour card. You'll get guys who make a Ryder Cup. You'll get guys who win a few tournaments. You can just go through everybody's career. It's about 20 years. They'll start to burn out about 16 years. You won't notice the last couple of years because they're, you know, they'll still be there, but they're not the same person. Nowadays, though, it's phenomenal. These kids come out now, two or three years on the tour, they're playing unbelievable, but it's very hard to live up to that peak. You know, they, they're not the same person afterwards. I think we're seeing that with Jordan Spieth. I mean, Jordan Spieth, and it's not like he's a bad player, right? He's still winning. He won two tour events, I think, you know, in the last 12 months or whatever it was. But just like, is he ever going to reach that 2015 level? Who knows? You know what? I give him, I give Jordan, his, his comeback is very strong. And I give him hope. 
as I said, there will be outliers. Somebody will do it. I'm hoping to do it twice. You know, I might as well hope. As in <laughs> everybody's, yeah, everybody. Your arms look fantastic. I think you're ready for it. Yeah, you're ready. I, I'm, move, I'm, move, I'm moving up to the camera. That's a good angle. That's smart. That's a smart way to say yeah, yeah, Bursting yeah, yeah. out of that shirt. The first thing I noticed, I said, this is a man that knows how to display his guns. <laughs> Tight shirt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, Padraig, I love, I love your energy. I love your passion for the game. It's phenomenal. Yeah, I, look, I burnt out myself. So in 2015, 16, I was burnt out of this game. You know, I just couldn't keep up that same pace. I'd been trying so hard, working so hard, so much into it. And, I, I you know, I looked at a bit of coaching because I love the coaching, like with the Paddy's golf tips. I, I, I talked about a bit of commentary. And then I went and played a few events in Europe. And there was a few Irish lads out there, Peter Laurie, Damon Rain on tour. And I really enjoyed myself. You know, a few friends out there, we were having a bit of crack. We were enjoying it. I said, you know what? I actually like golf. So I go to the best golf courses in the best condition. Tournaments are set up. I actually like that part. So how can I enjoy being a professional golfer? Because I wasn't enjoying it. I was, I was working too hard. So I looked at it and said, right, I, I don't keep up the same pace with a lot of things. Uh, if you turned around to me back then and said, We've got a hotel five minutes from the course at the motel, or we got a lovely, you know, Mandarin Oriental in, in the city, you know, 50 minutes away. I'm going, I'm staying in the city. If the lads back in the day said, we're going out to dinner, I go, well, I've got to go to the gym. I've got to go see my physio. Now, if, if they say we're going out for dinner at 8.30, I'm going. I don't care what my routine is. I'm trying to enjoy my life on tour much more because I can't sustain myself as a professional golfer at the pace I was going at. So it'd be the same for every everybody sitting there in their work career. You get to a point that you're burnt out and you're just wondering, should you give it up, try something else, start something new? Well, actually, if you're good at what you're doing, actually look what you like about it and try and get rid of what you don't like about it. So I got rid of a lot of stuff that I don't like. I'm a lot more relaxed about my diet. I'm a lot more like I'm more likely to go into the gym and work on the guns than yeah. I am going to go in and work on, on some fine I, little muscles. Speaking our language. Yeah. The Hollywood well, workout, baby. Diet, he buys, tries yeah. it for show. <laughs> like that's it. interesting yeah. though, right? Because a lot of people would say like it's the things that you're essentially trying to cut out that keep you at the top of your game. But you, what you're saying is that you want to be happy. And that is actually what gets you in the right state of mind to play better golf, which I think is interesting. I'm always going to do enough of the stuff. So yeah. I'm, I'm still going to hit enough practice shots. I'm still going to do enough gym work. I'm, I'm always going to do that. But I just can't, couldn't keep going at the young person's pace. I just can't. And, and, and I, I understand, like, if an event's in a nice venue, I'm more likely to want to play the event than if it's in a bad venue. Whereas 15 years ago, I couldn't care less. If you ran an event out on a runway out there, if you put up a, a decent prize fund of whatever I feel, I, I turn up. Now I, I want to go to nice cities. I want to go to nice places. I want to stay in nice hotels. I, I want to enjoy what goes with it, uh, which is fine. I don't regret what I, the way I've been, the intensity, but now I, you just, you, you've got to back off it at some stage. And, and it's working very well for me. Like I, I, I definitely, Champion Tour has been really a great eye opener. For, I'm a big fish in a small pond. I'm in contention You're pretty dominant. much every week. Yeah, yeah but, being in contention, you learn so much about your game. If you, I, I've been saying this, if I go to a regular tour event and say I have a good week and I was six shots back, say I finished the 20th, I'm probably six shots back. I go to my hotel room afterwards and I go, oh God, I got to hit the ball better. I got to hit the ball further. I got to swing the club better. Technical. Whereas if I play a Champions Tour event on a Sunday, I have a chance of winning with nine holes to go and I finish two shots back. I guarantee you, I'll sit and think about that round and I go, if I just wasn't right there with that drive, you know, I need to be better routine. I need to be better mental. So when you're nearly winning tournaments, all you focus on is your mental errors, mental mistakes, how to make that better. When you're a few shots off, you think it's always physical. So I'm much more, I, I've been much better on the mental side of things, much more doing what I should have, that I know I should have done for all those years, doing what I did in 2007 and 2008. But the problem is after 2011, I didn't think that was enough. So I was trying to do all the physical and the mental. Whereas I'm now back to the stage of going, you know what? The difference between winning any week on the Champions Tour is how good I am mentally. We should send this podcast to every pro golfer 20 to 23 years old right now and just like 
take a little bit of something of what he's saying now. This is wisdom because like, you don't like you're saying you you don't regret the way you played when you were like grinding, but can't couldn't you have taken a little bit of this wisdom when you were 25, 26 years old? Like wouldn't you have enjoyed it a little bit more? Maybe who knows what would have happened, you know what I mean? Yeah, I don't know if I I who knows. Right. Who knows would have been better? They, remember, you've got to remember, my that's that's not my personality at that stage. Right. You know, mm-hmm. everything about me, my whole life has been looking at the guy sitting next to me and going, "How the hell do I beat him?" So I if, love if that, we though. if we so if we sick. if we turned up and we were playing tiddlywinks, right? <laughs> if if uh, playing what now? Any sport, any sport. Let's tiddlywinks is a little thing that you flick. Any okay. playing any <laughs> stupid sport. Say we turned up and we played pool, okay? Yeah. So if you were way better than me at pool, I'd have no interest in playing. No interest in playing. If you were way worse than me at pool, I'd have no interest in playing. If you were slightly better than me, <laughs> I would love it. Because I, the <laughs> thing in my whole life is trying to beat somebody who's better than me, who I have a chance to beat, and try to figure out how I can be better and then learn from them to beat them. So uh, in my whole golf career, remember, I didn't play a pro event until I was 24 years of age. Mm. But I was number one in my category all the way up. So I became number one in my club, number one in my area, number one junior, number one, you know, all the way up. I kept getting to number one because I could only beat what I could see. So if you show me it, I will do it. That was me. That's my character. Clearly out in tour, I I lost that. I lost that mojo, as I said, when you. When you believe that you need more. That's the hard, you know, there's, a, there's a fine line, I suppose, between, you know, you're gaining experience. You've probably got a little bit of enthusiasm or naivety or innocence. When they cross, you're at your best, but eventually you kind of, it tapers too much experience, not enough. Innocence is not a good thing. <laughs> you, you lose that. So I'm trying to find it again and the Champions Store is helping. And I'm interested to see when I go back and play regular events, because my first three months of the year next year will be all regular tournaments, what what I'm like. Does does some of this good mental stuff cross over to me playing back on the the on with the kids? You talked about, you know, you getting the success of the satisfaction of beating people. I think it goes under the radar because of Phil's performance, but you finished fourth at the PGA last year. That was yeah, your two, first two, top two, 10, 2021. That was last year. Two, 2021. Okay, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, <laughs> that was your first top 10 what, in a major in what, 10 years. It was that, was that the, one of the more satisfying weeks you've had on a golf course, beating all the kids like that? Uh, you, that was a learning experience, believe it or not. God, I sound like club pro guy, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> How so? Maybe, maybe I am. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, uh, <laughs> I played with Shane Larry. I played with Phil in the first two rounds. I get on great with Phil and we had we had good crack. Jason Day was there and myself and Jason kind of a little bit in this. He's a younger version of me in the sense of, you know, he's just come out of that peak and he's trying to, he's, he's battling through what I would have battled through. He, he's trying to get back to his best by working hard. And that's really tough. You know, you, 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 the, the only way you get there, you think, well, I've got to do more work. I've got more in the gym, more practice, more, you know, so I, I, I had a good time with Jason, a great time with Phil for the two days. Played well. Uh, I know I played with somebody nice on the Saturday, and then I played with Shane Lowry on the Sunday. And myself and Shane, for whatever reason, we just had great crack on the day. We just, every hole, we were talking and joking and laughing at, you know, it, I think both of us hit good shots into the 13th, which is a, really one of the, 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 the last of the, well, for 17, but 13 is the last of the really tough holes in that stretch there. And like, after we both hit it in there close, I think he waved across at me, like, it gave me the, like, <laughs> wow, we've done it. Like, we've broken the back of this. Uh, so I realized, wow, I know I play so much better when I'm happy talking up on the golf course. I'm not a good person when I'm brooding on the golf course, when I'm thinking on the golf course. And believe it or not, this is really going to throw cat amongst the pigeons i am terrible when i'm thinking about stats on the golf course you should mm-hmm. never any of your golf any of your golfers out there listen, you should never be counting your fairways hit your greens hit on the golf course so you don't want to be analyzing that stuff it has nothing to do with scoring 
uh, just play away. And by talking and relaxing, that's the best possible way for me uh, of playing my best. And I saw it that day and I, I, I said to my caddy, which we knew, but it was a really good reminder. Look, you play your best when you're out there enjoying it, relaxed, having fun. I know I'm going to try. So it's not a question. You know, you could say this to a kid at 20 years of age, and if he doesn't have the work ethic in the first place, it's probably the wrong thing to say. But for somebody, I talk to most, and I do have a problem with your U.S. college system. It's burning out players dreadfully. They're playing too much? Well, yeah, not just playing too much. They're under too, just too much formality. To I, I talk to a few kids. They come home from the States, and the, you know, their parents ask me to talk to them. And like they're, they might be there from September to Christmas. And I say, okay, yeah. So what do you do? I says, I says, have you been out? And they go, no. We go back to our, we eat at six thirty because we have to eat the, the the free food, and then we go back to our dorm. And there's four of us, and they play video games. And I'm going, but do you not go to any parties? He says, well, we're playing golf on the weekends. I says, well, at least in the midweek you've gone to a few movies and things. No, they literally twenty four seven golf. They're getting up in the morning, going to going to the gym at six, which is terrible, by the way. Most people do not want to go to the gym at six o'clock in the morning. Nope. It's not good for you to get up that early. Nobody on your show sleep. does. Tell you that much. Yeah. <laughs> no, sir. And, 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 and then they they have to attend classes, which is bizarre from our perspective. In Europe, if you attend the course, you have to pass the course. You get a bonus for attending the class, but you don't have to attend. If you pass, you pass. That's it. So they have to attend classes and then they have to practice and they have to practice the way the coach wants them to practice. And of course, and then they have to play the way the coach wants them to play. There's a lot of conformity. Basically, the coach keeps his job as long as the players fit the mold. And the only ones that are successful in college are the big enough stars that go into college and don't have to do what the coach says, do their own things or, and leave early enough that they don't do that for four years. It's too, too constrained. Guys, you're meant to go to college to learn about yourself. You are meant to come out of college having got a lot of things out of your system that you're ready for the real world. You yeah. are not meant to go to college. It is not meant to be that uniform. Like, and, and I would say, I would say to a lot of US players, which US players don't, we have a, we have, getting this problem in Europe now with the good players. They're starting to play mini tours, waiting to play local mini tours when. They should be traveling the world. If you're a good US player, you should be going. I know it's difficult now with live on issues, but you should be going to the Asian tour. You'll learn unbelievably about yourself on golf by playing the Asian tour. You remember, not as much now, but the kids I played against in Asia back in the day, they were feeding not them themselves, they were feeding their families and their cousins. That was how big that was to them. They would, they'd be horrible in their swings and their way they play but they'd skin you alive in the golf course they were that good because they were playing for their life and mm. you go up against these in their conditions you'll learn a thing or two about how to play golf going down the road playing a local mini tour event you're not learning anything so I think college it's just knocking the edges off these kids burning them out I, I would prefer them to be enjoying it a little bit more and, and coming out more rounded individuals there's almost no one listening to this show that's going to disagree that college should be a lot more about not going to class and going mm -hmm. out and having a good time. So yeah. I, I think I'm, you're you're going to find a lot of allies when it comes to that. That day I'm still sure. thinking about I'm still thinking about throw the cat among the pigeons. That's something that's I've never a, heard before. That's a good one. <laughs> you know, I heard that. Be, Does that mean just I'm like sure things are going to go crazy when I say this? Well, yeah. Okay. Like, I, I, what else would it be? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I'm sure you've got Good some point. other ones. Uh, I don't know, like the the, the fox and the chick, chicken coop, something like that. You know, yeah. it'd be mad that panic. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. yeah. I like yeah. It. The hen house. Uh, uh, yeah. There you go. Um, Patrick, we know you got to go. We know you got a busy week. Uh, this was awesome. We got to have you back on soon because I got a bunch of things written down here. We didn't even get to. I got a bunch of your tips that I took away from your Twitter account that people should absolutely go follow you because they're really, really good tips. A lot of them are against kind of conventional wisdom and yeah, they're all on YouTube. Yeah, go ahead. Paddy's Golf Tips on YouTube. They're all okay. there. But I want to say one thing. Check this it is out. We've, got, we, we've got, all got to look out for this week. We're, I'm at the PNC Championship this week. So the old father and son, now it's player and relative. So Tiger's here with Charlie Woods, obviously, right? And we're playing on Sunday. And some of this is going to go up against the World Cup soccer. 
Oh. I'm wondering will we, I'm wondering will Tiger get better ratings than the World Cup? <laughs> or will Charlie <laughs> get better ratings than the World Cup? So that will truly sit that that truly puts a like we're all everybody's wanting to watch Tiger play and Charlie. Uh, Charlie seems phenomenal uh, at this this level. What, by the way, what will decide whether somebody is good in terms of professional golf? The kids are all going to be physically good. It will come down to how much they love the game. That's it in the end of the day. If you've got a kid out there, if you can get them, I did a tip there. One of my latest Paddy golf tips is bring the kid when you're starting your 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 kid grandchild in, in golf, bring them to somewhere that you're not stressed. Because that, you know, they'll pick up on your stress if you bring them to your formal golf club. Bring them somewhere that you're not stressed. Bring them home before they get tired. So in the middle of it, say they have to go so that they want to go back. That's like going to the gym. You never wait till you're tired in the gym to leave. Leave when you feel good. Because then you'll remember to go back. And the third thing, which I think is the biggest thing if you're getting your kids into the game of golf, when you finish up, go spend 10, 15 minutes on the way home Either go into the clubhouse and sit in the bar and have a Coca-Cola or go have an ice cream with, with, with your son or daughter. They'll remember that for the rest of their life. And every time they go play golf, they'll actually be remembering the 15 minutes of their own time with the parent, whichever the mother of or mother of a father, the 15 minutes that they got to spend as a big person sitting at the bar or whatever it is, having a Coca-Cola. And the golf, every time they pick off, really is what they're remembering is that happy memory of their their one-on-one time with their parents so it's more about how much a kid loves the game they'll all find out how to be good at it it's not the hardest game in the world the coaching is great now they'll find a way if they love the game and remember most people with sport time seem to want their kids to be good first and the problem is if, if they're good first, when they plateau at some stage, everybody plateaus. It doesn't matter if you're throwing a baseball or, or whatever it is, you will have a stage that you plateau. And if it's everything is dependent on being good and you plateau, you'll give the game up. Whereas if you really love it, the plateau won't be the end of the world. You'll figure a way out through it. So always instru- try to strive for how can I instill that love? And kids, remember, if you're starting a kid off the game of golf at 10 years of age, they will probably play the game for could be a hundred years. How mad is that? <laughs> my uh, my brother is going to eat that up because he's trying to get my nephew to obviously want to play golf because he loves to play golf. So I'm gonna he's gonna eat. I'm telling you, Kyle, listen to this. Get him a little ice cream afterwards, and he's gonna be hooked. Just just make it fun. The kids will figure. They don't need to be told anything. Kids will figure it out. They will figure it out. And if you if if you're a teenage kid or like maybe you know you're starting to be good at the game, get them a little monitor. That P or G or monitor, two hundred bucks, that will give them speed. They'll figure speed out by just looking at the monitor. So just they, let them have fun. Kids are really good at figuring figuring stuff out. So just let them at it in a nice. And if you went to most pros on tour, they'll tell you they had some. Like I, I my dad built the golf course. It was my playground. He built the golf course with 12 other, 11 other policemen. It's like the apostles at this stage. But they built it like a, you know. But I actually helped physically build one of the greens, the 12th green, when I was four years of age, five years of age. It's your, it's your place. It was my place. I, I hung around. I chased rabbits. I, 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 you know, I lived around the golf course 15 minutes from it. So I hung out there. And so many golfers will tell you that story that they just, it was just the place they they hung out with their friends. They played, in my case, we played snooker. We played golf. We did whatever. We played cards as it got a little older and stuff like that. It was, it was, it was some club. But that gave me the love of, of golf. And, and that means that the tough days, you, you figure out, oh, I'll, I'll get through this. Wisdom. Wow. This wisdom, has been a dude. podcast full of wisdom from our guy. <laughs> I love Truly. It. We don't get a lot of wisdom on this show, to be honest. Very little. I would say very little. Very little. Very little. Uh, we really appreciate it. This was this was awesome. This was a blast getting to talk to you. Like I said, your energy right now for golf is insanely high. Oh yeah, you know what? I'm enjoying myself. I'm I'm loving it. Mind you, I am here with my son this week. So cleaning up on the champion store. Of course, you're enjoying yourself. I am inclined to join this, but the father and son, there is an element of stress here. I can tell you. So I, I actually think with the father and son, we should do like a 
Do you have a Chris Kindle? We kind of we, every father should be given, or every parent here, obviously, because Annika's here and, and Nelly, I suppose. But we should be given another partner's son or daughter. Or you just want to play with Charlie. Coach. No, 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 to coach because you can't coach your own kid. You can never <laughs> yeah. coach your own kid. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody, right, this is what you do. Because every everybody, you can see it, everybody's, oh, because we're all pros, we're all saying, well, you know, you should do a little bit of this or a little bit of that. But it's, it's there's a lot of stress. There's a lot <laughs> of, of nerves going on. This is, this is uh, maybe I'm better off leaving him alone. So my, Padre's going to, Padre's going to get paired up with Charlie Woods and give him a little ice cream after. And Charlie's going to look at him in the eyes and just crush it in his hands and be like, <laughs> no, and just walk away. <laughs> Daddy told me no. Daddy told me no sweets until I destroy you. No sugar until after my first major. No sugar till a major. Patty's gonna be like, okay, see you later. Oh, that's good. Oh shit. Well, thanks for the time, man. Incredible. This has been really yeah. good. We really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, Padraig, we really appreciate it. This was a blast. We got to have you back on again soon. Thanks, guys. I enjoyed it. Yeah, sometime. Best have fun luck. this yeah, week. Absolutely. Good luck. See ya. Good luck, Thank guys. You so Thanks, much. lads.